so it'll be good good content good information we're going to go quickly to my powerpoint i apologize i still haven't learned how to sort of start this the when live so you're gonna have to look at my screen there we go that's us multifamily finance summit november 6th thanks for joining i got to thank our sponsors our sponsors have been with us through covid um it was a bit of a nightmare when I was on spring break and somebody said, we're gonna shut down the event and travel industry uh, because that's about 70% of what we do at RE Journals. Uh, but we have, we have pivoted just like everybody else and, and these folks have pivoted with us. So thanks to Bridgewater Bank, Beard Group, Mohagen Hansen, Pace Equity, Colliers, uh, MH, Minnesota Housing, Great Southern Bank and MHA. You all are wonderful and we greatly appreciate it. We couldn't do any of this stuff without you. Uh, this is us, RE Journals. In case you didn't know, all you Minnesota folks know Jeff Johnson probably, bought the Minnesota Real Estate Journal three, four years ago now. And have since we've gone out and acquired some more uh, entities. So we now have six publications, 17 states. We're on track to do over 200 events this year. So the chat room, the chat room's a little different if you've logged into our events before. We're switching from Webinar Jam to Zoom. You have to actually actively open up the chat room in Zoom. It's probably at the bottom of your screen. Uh, I'm going to go in there. I see somebody put something on there already. I'm going to go in there and just say hi. So now you should have a red little light on that chat room. Open that up because that's where you can communicate with each other. And that's also where you can uh, ask questions of our panelists. So please do that. Please make this an interactive panel. We want to try to replicate being together as, as much as we possibly can. So here we go. Current trends in multifamily housing and financing. I may pop in here to put people's bios up on the screen, but that's I'm going to get out of the way right now and turn this over to Ann. Well, welcome and good morning. Uh, my name is Ann Mavity and I am the Executive Director of the Minnesota Housing Partnership. And I'm really excited about our panel this morning. Uh, the way we're gonna proceed, I, I think this virtual format is actually a plus for being able to be a lot, a lot more interactive. So if you all listening have questions or comments, put them in the chat. As our panelists present, I'll try to track those and raise those up back to the panelists. Uh, we have one hour and a lot of great speakers, so we're gonna uh, jump in uh, quickly here. Uh, we're gonna talk today about uh, multifamily housing finance, and we'll start with uh, Tom O'Neill. But before we do that, um, I just wanna say, Minnesota Housing Partnership, where I work, uh, we convene housing stakeholders around driving policies and investments in affordable housing at the state, legislatively and with the administration. And we also advocate with partners at the federal level on affordable housing. And we provide research to inform those discussions and technical assist directly to rural community and native communities in Minnesota and actually around the country. Um, so that help them plan for affordable housing. So I'll be diving more deeply into affordable housing issues at the Real Estate Journal Summit on Affordable Housing in December. How's that for a plug? Uh, but certainly uh, with the national and the state eviction moratoriums and the risk of literally more than 100,000 Minnesotans that might be losing their homes um, at the end of this, it's going to be disruptive, not just to the market, but to actual people who are struggling in this crazy pandemic fueled economic environment we're in. But today's panel will focus broadly on the multifamily market, as we talked about. Um, each panelist is going to introduce themselves and their work. We're gonna have about four to five minutes per panelist, and then as time allows, we'll get to questions. So remember to put those in the chat. So we're gonna start with uh, Tom O'Neill, who's the Vice President of Market Development at Collier's Mortgage. Tom? Great, thanks, Ann. Uh, everyone can hear me, I assume, thumbs up? Great, saw a couple. <laughs> um, well, welcome everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to the industry today on this uh, topic. A lot's gone on, of course, uh, with the pandemic and with the, the housing market. And hopefully I can present some information that spurs some discussion or maybe a, a few insights. Um, I was provided or asked to provide a quick update on kind of the broad uh, multi-family market trends and also a, a dive on the Twin Cities. Um, and this is, this is based on resources that come across my desk in the form of kind of industry reports, newsletters, articles, online conferences. I kind of amalgamate probably 30 different sources. So hopefully this makes some sense. Uh, I'm gonna do a screen share here to get to my PowerPoint presentation. And hopefully we're there. Uh, thumbs up from someone, I can't see if the, uh, got it, great. Okay, 
Uh, and again, <clears throat> I'm, I'm with Collier's Mortgage, formerly uh, Doherty Mortgage, and we are an agency lender based in uh, Minneapolis. Um, we have a nationwide platform of uh, multifamily loan products, uh, HUD, Fannie, bank participation. We just uh, a wide variety of capabilities to uh, finance all sorts of multifamily housing. So I'll get into my presentation here. Uh, first of all, just some of the data sources that I've, I relied on for today. Uh, Collier's Mortgage, our internal database of projects that we track in the Twin Cities. We spent a lot of time uh, looking at the market. Reese, uh, which is Moody's Analytics, Witten Advisors, Real Capital An Analytics, Market Advisors, multi -house, Minnesota Multi-Housing, Greater Minnesota Housing Fund, Family Housing Fund, and the U.S. Census Bureau. So a wide variety of local and national sources. I'll talk about some national trends first, then get into the Twin Cities, get into some kind of operating uh, measures on uh, multifamily operations, and then talk about some indicators of stress from the pandemic on people and households, and then just get into a quick uh, outlook on the Twin Cities. First of all, just nationally what's happened, uh, the federal stimulus program has really lessened a lot of damage uh, to the market uh, through the late summer anyway. Um, it's estimated that in the second quarter alone, uh, the various stimulus programs saved about 15% in a, in a GDP loss on a kind of annualized basis. So it's very, very helpful to stabilize households and, and properties. Um, through mid-year, the, the national multifamily market reported pretty steady performance um, and despite a very volatile label, labor market. So uh, that, that, was, that was good in terms of multifamily performance. Vacancies nationwide were mostly held in check by the various uh, eviction moratoria that were at the federal and, and state level. Um, but the situation, as Ann, I'm sure, will talk about, is, uh, is changing uh, significantly as the moratorium or moratoria expire. Apartment sales volume, I think Gina will probably get into this, is down greatly ac across the country. I've seen 65 to 70 percent. Uh, investors have stepped back. It doesn't mean that they're not doing activity, but the broad based uh, trading is, is not there. Uh, but for sales, they're talking about for sales uh, being uh, important in the market now as, as financially stressed properties are, are uh, you know, offered up. Uh, new construction dropped substantially in the spring with the pandemic. It rebounded in the summer. Um, and now at, uh, through the end of the year, it, it might hold steady nationally, but it's expected to drop uh, significantly in 2021. Rent, gro rent growth has gone negative and it's expected to, to stay negative or at best uh, zero growth through the end of next year. Um, the construction slowdown should help uh, occupancy gains uh, nationwide uh, next year. There's still a ton of un uncertainty uh, due to the continued delay and the additional stimulus, which I'm sure you're all following in the media. It's been put off and put off um, and really multifamily and, and commercial real estate in general is not going to function fully until we get a vaccine and people feel comfortable uh, being together socially again. Um, the financial impact has been measurably worse for low and moderate income households, which translates to tougher performance for B and C class properties in multifamily. And conversely, it's kind of, we're in kind of a perverse situation where lower and moderate income families are really struggling, but some of the more, uh, middle and higher income remote workers are actually experiencing involuntary savings, what the economists are calling involuntary savings because of remote work and saving all the money uh, from not going to work, spending money on lunches out and things like that. So it's a, it's a crazy situation. And of course, the, an additional stimulus is vital to keep many households from economic collapse. In the Twin Cities <clears throat> this year, we expect well over 9,000 units to be delivered and this is uh, just non-senior units. Uh, so it's a record a level of production, at least uh, since I've been tracking this going back to 2010. Um, the, if you throw in senior housing, which I'm kind of loosely tracking, I, I track affordable senior housing very closely, but I don't track market rate. But if you throw all the senior housing in, I think we could be up to 12,000 units delivered this year, which is an enormous number. And it's the better part of a full year's worth of household growth. So that just shows you the big market share that multifamily is taking uh, this year. The supply path was mostly set by the start of the pandemic. Projects had their approvals, their financing was coming together. The designs were done. So before the pandemic, 2020 was kind of set at a very high volume. 
We had about 4,200 new units in the suburbs, a little bit lower percentage-wise than in recent years, which has been running at about 50% in the suburbs. But numerically, that 4,200 is, is, a, is a record number that I've seen. So a lot more production in the suburbs. Uh, produced about 1,300 affordable units this year, or, or we should, um, second only to last year. And that's great. Um, and if you throw in the uh, senior affordable, we're up to close to 2,000, which is a pretty, it's a real good number in, in the context of the last 10 years. So overall, there's a growing dispersion of units across the metro area. More suburbs are getting into, uh, into the market, which is great. But on the, the downside, the affordable production is still way below what we, we need to keep up with growing demand year to year. Some of the current indications of multifamily operations in the Twin Cities, uh, vacancy climbed this quarter to about 5%, which is up about a point and a half over a year ago. Vacancies are higher due to a, a very notable drop in absorption of new units, 50 to 70%, depending on the source you're looking at. And of course, this record number of new deliveries. Um, the current trend is kind of crunching some of the math that anywhere from about a point and a half to two and a half points of uh, market vacancy could be embedded in this new supply that's not leasing up as quickly as, as, as uh, historically it has. So the new supply not leasing up is, is a significant issue in my mind. Uh, market experts uh, that are tracking this closer than I say that somewhere near about 6% overall vacancy is expected at the end of next year. Uh, rent growth turned negative uh, this quarter and is expected to drop as low as perhaps negative 3% uh, during 2021. And this, this comes after some really strong years in recent years of four and a half, five, five and a half uh, percent increases. So a, a great change uh, there. Um, again, the record new supply and the weak absorption should drive the rent loss in, in uh, this year and, and into next. Um, and again, rent growth is probably not likely until the end of next year. Uh, HAP contract properties, of course, are faring, faring the best in the affordable sector, including NOAA properties and everything, because they have, they have their stable rent payments. A few more indicators. Rent collections have declined across all building classes. There was a recent survey uh, released by uh, Multi-Housing Association in October that said that Class A properties are collecting at about 96%. Class B at about 93% and Class C at about 85%. Concessions are much more widespread now. Uh, we have looked at the new projects that have opened, the market rate projects that are opening this year and just formally published concessions on at least a third of the projects, probably more. Typical concessions being one to three months free rent, which is eight, eight to 25% off on that particular unit. Um, uh, you know, over the course of a year. Uh, and of course, there's, if a renter approaches a, a building owner and says, hey, I want to live here, what can you offer? There's, there's behind the scenes negotiations going on. I know that's, that's occurred with some of the uh, people that I work with who have directly negotiated with landlords for, for rent breaks when they're moving from building to building. Operating expenses are up and income is down. The Greater Minnesota Housing Fund is doing a monthly survey of about 30,000 units throughout the state. 70% of the operator Operators are citing lower revenue during the pandemic, and 90% are uh, citing higher operating expenses. Just some quick indicators from the U.S. Census on the stressors that are happening on people and households from the pandemic. And uh, the U.S. Census Bureau stepped up and started an effort in March to just tackle trying to measure what's going on due solely to the, the pandemic. And this chart here, it's a little bit crazy with the color scheme, but uh, if you can follow it with me, um, just teleworking, one of the, fir the first measures that we talked about, it, it just shows you just the amount of disruption in people's work lives. About 41% of Minnesotans, based on the last two-week survey, are living in households that are doing some or, or all of their uh, work remotely. 17% of households expect a loss in income over the next month. It's a pretty substantial number. 23% are having difficulty paying for usual household expenses, uh, which is quite a large number there. Uh, and then on the food insecurity side, uh, there are about 5.7% of Minnesota households have experienced, uh, sometimes or often not enough to eat, which is really a, a sobering statistic. 
So just a last slide on kind of the outlook as, as I see it. Um, the record number of multifamily units delivered this year are gonna take probably double the time to be absorbed based on just current trends. The volume of deliveries is going to stay high as well based on what's under construction right now. Uh, just quick benchmark, last decade, I tracked about 435 total properties. Right now, I'm tracking 420 that are either under construction, uh, they were completed this year under construction, or are planned or proposed. So it's just an enormous volume of units that could, could hit the market, could still hit the market. Uh, Broad-based rent growth won't like, likely happen until the end of next, uh, next year. A net operating income will be challenged by lower revenues and higher expenses. Discounts for lease renewals and concessions uh, should continue through, through many sub-markets. Um, and on the bright side, affordable production, hopefully these projects continue to move forward. We could hit maybe 2,500 uh, units of affordable each, each in the next, uh, the next two years. And then finally, uh, last point of my uh, slide presentation, that renter households in the B and C class properties are, are just gonna be under increasing stress um, until we have renewed support programs, uh, income support, rent support, wh however, whatever form they come. So there's still a lot of work uh, to be done. Make sure we stabilize and, and hopefully keep the multifamily market as healthy as possible through um, the end of this uh, pandemic. So I will stop sharing and we'll kick it back to Ann. And uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to present. Thank you, Tom. I, I love how you ground us in the data. Your charts uh, are not that complicated. They're very straightforward and I appreciate <laughs> that. Um, Gina, I'm gonna toss it to you. You also have some uh, broad, sort of a broad view of what's happening out there. And then after that, I'm gonna throw it over to Alex. Some of the questions that were coming up to just about the various markets. How, obviously this information, it doesn't impact everything equally. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about some of those sub-markets in a minute. But Gina, why don't we start with you um, in preventing, uh, presenting some other uh, framing information on this. And you are muted. Are you with us? Yeah, there we go. And Gina, remember to unmute. Yeah, thank yep. you. Unmuted and are you, let's see, my slides up on your screen. Um, so Gina Dingman, I am president of Everest Real Estate Advisors. Multi, we do multifamily brokerage debt and equity placement. We're doing much more consulting this year <laughs> than uh, transactions and my charts as well as Tom's information will explain that. Um, just a brief overview, um, as, as Tom mentioned, transaction volume is, is down substantially on an individual level. Total transaction volume is off 70%. And, and this is just the Twin Cities. I didn't do a national look. Um, like Tom, I, I looked at um, Reese and Real Capital Analytics and Axiometrics and RealPage, and everybody's information was pretty much the same on uh, on the market. So, um, so uh, price per unit, we're we're starting to see that dip now. On a well, I'll go into the charts when we're done. Cap rate, cap rates are. A, really staying steady primarily. Um, sales volume, this chart, uh, you can see we are getting close to 2015 sales volume numbers. We are at about a half, half a billion dollars this year to date, and we've been north of two billion the last couple of years, so transaction volume is down substantially. I did look at national numbers, and it, it's pretty much the same across the country. Um, another just chart on on sales volume. Um, I think the deals that got done first quarter of this year were primarily in the works last year. And since then, just another, another view of uh, transaction volume dropping off. And, and Tom, I just, I was gonna ask you, do you, I'm, I'm assuming you're mostly seeing refis right now in addition to construction loans. I mean, are you seeing much or hearing much transaction volume about people talking about you know, most of what I hear, people have been saying, 
you know, they've had products, product teed up to sell this year, no matter how many acquisitions or dispositions they do, most are waiting. Um, have, mm -hmm. Do you anticipate that trend to continue or do you see much action picking up? Uh, well, just from our shop, I know that refinance transactions have been really high volume. And I think some new constructions, I'm not sure on the acquisitions, I haven't talked to their team lately, uh, and I'm not in underwriting on a day-to-day -day basis, um, but I think the acquisitions are, are down it's, and it's probably opportunistic acquisitions, but certainly the refinances are off the charts. We've been, our office has been extremely busy. Our HUD group has been hiring people. Um, so, uh, and I think it's largely due to, to uh, refinances. Do any of the, do uh, Alex or Ben or Ann, any thoughts on what you're seeing from a transaction or, or whether or not your Alex, you know, anything's on the, has COVID changed what you were going to do, I guess, or changed your existing plans? Um, not really, honestly. I mean, Gina, our specific focus over the last few years has really been on doing affordable housing development. So, you know, obviously there's still a strong need and demand for that. And we've, continued kind of as planned, you know, there was probably a few months there where, um, you know, we kind of pressed pause a little bit just at the beginning of the pandemic, but um, we've kind of continued business uh, as planned. Um, so. Yeah, Gina, I think uh, on our team, we're seeing, uh, like Tom said earlier on, it was a bulk refinancings at the beginning of COVID. We saw a lot of deals that were not, uh, up hard with cash, um, fall out of bed. But uh, those that were either 1031 exchanges or had hard cash, those ones continue to move forward on the acquisition front. And then we did see a wall, you know, in that late March, April, and even into May. But I think we're starting to see acquisitions and we have for the last uh, couple months come into play where our, our uh, financing assignments are a little bit more balanced now than they were early summer with some acquisitions and um, still a lot of refis though, like Tom said, rates are really low and, and terms are very attractive. So. Thanks. Um, interesting. Hey, Gina, this is uh, yeah. Dan Rebel. I can chip in as well here. I mean, I, I think I'd echo what everybody's saying, particularly in the Minneapolis market where, you know, we've been doing a lot of refis as, as we've gone along. I think that you're starting to see more sales. I will say though, you know, as a national company and we've rolled out, multifamily investment sales across a number of markets and, and particularly in, in some of our Southern markets that are a little more transactional like Phoenix and, and Dallas and even Denver, um, you know, some down in Florida. It, it, I think everybody kind of held their properties off the market originally because nobody was obviously for obvious reasons, nobody was really sure what was, was going to happen. And, and then there was a, 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 you know, kind of a bid ask difference where, the buyers were expecting a COVID discount. The sellers didn't want to provide it. And mm -hmm. so there was just a stalemate. And then, you know, within the last month or two, particularly again, like our, our Dallas and, and Phoenix offices, I saw somebody on this that's listening in from Texas. So maybe not surprised, but you know, that, that volume's really ramped up uh, quite a bit. And, and I think it was just a lot of pent up, you know, sellers and buyers both. And so, you know, it'll be interesting to see what happens if there's no more stimulus and, and um, you know, if these, some of these metrics start to start to dip a little bit, but for now we, we've seen a big uptick in sales volume as of late. Uh, and those markets are often leaders. So that, that makes sense. Um, I'll, I'll go through these last two slides. I have one more question when I'm done for the, for the, for the rest of the group. Um, price per unit is starting to, to tick down. Um, I, I anticipate that that's just a combination of collections and expenses, as Tom mentioned, you know, it, um, so, um, fortunately, some of the buyers in the market with that kind of capital demand that, that, uh, Dan just mentioned are, are willing to take that gap of where, you know, where we've been, whether it's a price per unit or on other metrics and and try to get there by assuming that we're going to have this is buyers not refinancing and i'm not sure how you would underwrite it but they're the buyers are that i'm talking to are trying to be more optimistic and and kind of underwriting away the the deficits that they're seeing now so they're they're being more aggressive sometimes than i would be even on 
either lowering expenses or increasing rent growth when you get to a certain point. Are, are you seeing that trend as well? Any of you? No? Ben, were you trying to jump in? Yeah, I think, I think we're seeing some of that hesitation. Like you said earlier, Gina, is a lot of hesitation back March, May, April, or April, May um, at the beginning. But now that overall, I mean, Minneapolis, I think, has been a lot healthier than the nation um, from occupancy staying high and collections remaining pretty, pretty high. Um, so I think that's that's helped the sales and I think that's helped Minneapolis sales come back a little bit further or faster than other markets. Um, I think also the availability of debt, which Dan and I will uh, talk about here in a minute is, you know, with where rates were at the beginning of the year uh, and where they've dropped, I mean, almost a full percentage point, that's kind of helped make up for some of the uncertainty of where uh, maybe occupancy dropped a little bit or there's been some, um, or actually maybe occupancy stayed the same, but more importantly, collections have dropped and right. the bigger issue uh, and how agencies and life companies really look at, at income and, and sizing alone is, is what, what are collections looking like. So I think the, the drop in interest rates have kind of helped offset some of the uncertainty and being able to lock 10 year money at 3% or even well below 3% with the agencies is giving people um, the IRRs that they were looking for on a leverage level pre COVID. Um, so I think that's one factor too. So you, you have, are you seeing underwriting hurdles come down or, or just, what kind of returns people are targeting today versus pre-COVID, begin the you know the beginning of first quarter? You know, I'll be honest. I don't I don't focus um, too much on the IRRs that investors are are looking for. Um, focusing with me focusing on the financing side, but um, I would say that from an underwriting standpoint, um, you know, buyers continue to be uh, for the most part more optimistic on their controllable expenses than what the seller was having for the last few years or several years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think um, in a lot of cases, that's, that's true. Sometimes some sellers just aren't as uh, competitive with controllable expenses, or maybe they got um, not focused uh, in some areas and trying to sharpen their pencil in every r &M category and payroll after owning a property for a number of years. So I think uh, we're still seeing that. And as long as an appraisal can support those and there's true market comps for those controllables, we will see um, underwriting that is more aggressive, but market supportable um, for buyers than we're seeing on a lot of seller um, trailing 12 operating statements. Yeah, this, this is Dan. I just add to that. I, you know, I think if you, especially if you talk to investment sales brokers, you know, they look at it and say, well, the cap rates have kind of, you know, remained fairly constant, but the debt has dropped, you know, the cost of debt has dropped significantly. And so the spread there is actually is wider, wider than it's, that it's been. Right. And so they look at that as, you know, this might be the best time, even though you're paying, um, you know, what, what appears to be a, it, you're paying, I don't know, premium, but it, the deals appear to be relatively thin from a cap rate perspective. The the gap between cost of debt and the cap rate is actually pretty wide, uh, historically speaking. So, so with that, and then you know the ability to get IO debt at sub three percent, like it's been alluded to, it just makes you know it makes these deals work and uh, generating a ton of cash flows, which helps the IRRs in the process. Uh, and I think, oh, go ahead, whoever was going to talk, go ahead. Hey, Gina, it's Ben. I was, I was going to say it'd be interesting if Tom has some input on this too. Um, but just with all of his market data, you know, it, it seems like some, some buyers are also looking at the drop in collections um, pretty optimistically. Um, and we'll see if that's right or, or wrong, you know, come next summer and everything like that. But I think a lot of 
with the eviction moratorium, you know, if, if you've got tenants in there that aren't paying, I think that's all almost looked at as opportunistic from the buyer. A lender is going to take, you know, a lender look at it and, and not appreciate that. Um, but they're saying, well, geez, come spring or whenever we can evict tenants, um, we're, we're going to get the bad tenants out. We're going to get new tenants in there. We still see uh, a constraint on housing, especially in B and C properties. Um, there's a lack of NOAA properties and units out there and, and rents that are affordable. So I think we're still seeing rent growth being projected, um, not at the same pace as before, but still rent growth and hoping that those tenants that aren't paying uh, or maybe are delinquent uh, turn into a paying tenant next spring when, uh, when rollover happens. Yeah, I, I, I think that's, that's true, true, Ben. Um, just one thing I wanted to cite from uh, I believe it was a Greater Minnesota Housing Fund survey that a number, a significant percentage of the property owners that they survey are in financial difficulty and are considering offering their properties up for sale, which would be an opportunistic purchase for someone else. So I think what you talked about, uh, unfortunately, for on the renter side, um, I think that that trend is, uh, is, is growing and will be there. Well, well I, Gene, I want I want you to be able to wrap up in just a second, but I I, I would I have a question also because it feels like with a projected one hundred and thirty two thousand possible evictions to occur once these eviction uh, eviction moratoriums lift in Minnesota alone, um, about how disruptive that could be in generally. Clearly, it'll be disruptive to the lowest income households, but in terms of uh, how the market will respond. I know, Gene, I recall a couple of years ago, you and I sitting around that the opportunity, as Ben has pointed out, for uh, property sales is one side of it, but the other side of it, of course, is that every time a sale happens, the rents increase and put that squeeze on that affordable uh, renter who's trying to access those units as well. Um, in, in terms of, so I, I'd love to hear folks' thoughts on that as you're uh, commenting. But Gina, why don't you finish up and then finish Alex, like, yeah. you about some of those affordable market uh, questions. Okay. Well, thank thank you for um, for your input. I I would just say that to to kind of what Ben and and Tom and Dan were speaking to, I'm seeing because there's a pent up supply of capital, as I'm sure these guys know, that because there haven't been anything to invest, so there's a lot of money raised and. So the funds that are sitting there from the end of 19 that have however many hundreds of millions or billions of dollars that thought they were going to go out and buy 25 or 35 or 40 properties this year have maybe bought one nationally. So the what I'm seeing is that the this COVID piece of distress the in the product in property I guess I'll just call it that for lack of anything else is now being viewed as a kind of a value add one more value add play because people think that they can they can squeeze those numbers on either side or they will um, that doesn't speak to the evictions i i certainly hope that that's something that is covered in the next stimulus so that we don't see that kind of evictions that's that would be a, i don't know i have no idea how the market could remotely manage the, that number of of people without a home because we, we don't have the homeless we don't have the supply of affordable housing today and even really workforce housing to cover those kind of evictions. At least not, I'm not aware of that. So th thank you. Thank yeah. you for letting me this way. I'll stay on for a couple of minutes and then I'll jump on to get to talk to the next panel. <laughs> that sounds great. Um, and that's a perfect segue, Alex, into really talking about what's your bread and butter on that affordable side and, and what you're seeing. Yeah, thanks, Anne. Hi, I'm Alex Bazanz, a development partner with Real Estate Equities. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about our portfolio, I think, initially, and then I'm going to get into just some of the specific projects that we've done in Rochester uh, that are workforce housing projects. So, um, you know, real estate equities, I mean, our portfolio is about 75% affordable, 25% market rate. And even our market rate, for the most part, are, are B and C properties, um, generally speaking. You know, we have about 4,000 units in the portfolio. Um, I just wanted to speak a little bit to kind of our overall portfolio performance 
Today, physical occupancy is kind of hovering in that 95 to 96 percent range. Um, collections, you know, since the pandemic kind of started to now, you know, we were at about 96, 97 percent in March. We kind of stayed through that through July as the stimulus was still available. Um, so that stayed pretty steady. Today, um, as of most recent statistic, like late October, we're at about 90 percent of collections. So, you know, I think overall, considering what's been going on and what the market data is telling us, I think we're reasonably happy with how the portfolio has performed as a whole. Um, but obviously, it's it's down. So, just wanted to kind of speak to that again, specific to our portfolio. Um, in terms of Rochester, I mean, our business, you know, our core business is really developing, uh, for the most part, new construction, affordable housing projects. And the majority of what we're doing are projects that are financed with taxes and bonds, uh, 4% low-income housing tax credits, tax increment financing, uh, and then either a, a Freddie Tell structure or, or HUD mortgages, uh, with, you know, typically a 221 D4. In Rochester, uh, Eastgate is 135 units in Southeast Rochester. Uh, that project uh, was a bond deal. Um, and it's, it's performed actually quite well. I mean, the, the lease up was a little bit slower than expected um, initially. Um, you know, we kind of started the lease up before, a little bit before the pandemic, but the lease up uh, was a little bit slower than we thought. But overall today, the project's at 98% occupancy. Um, and you know, economic occupancy or collections is in the high 80s, um, which again is, is down, but um, I think it's kind of, based on what's going on, what we kind of figured would happen. Um, our other project in Rochester is called Technology Park Apartments. Um, that project's a little bit different. That's in Northwest Rochester. It's 164 units. Um, that project uh, was not a bond deal. That project was financed uh, with uh, just a, a bank loan, a construction loan. And we did a Freddie Forward product uh, through, through Merchants Capital um, and did a, did a joint venture. That project does not have TIF. That project's kind of interesting because it has kind of, and I've talked about it before, I think, in some of these panels, but it has kind of a combination of, of income levels. We've got 40% of the units at 60% AMI, another 35% at 80% AMI, and then 25% uh, at market. Um, on that project, we partnered with, the great, with Greater Minnesota Housing uh, as our partner on that project, um, and it's performed incredibly well. I mean, it's a very nice product, but it's a very simple product that has surface parking, it's four story stick frame, um, very efficient common areas, very efficient building, nice finishes, uh, but we were able to build it at a very reasonable price. So um, our lease have started, well construction completed in by the end of March. And as of September, uh, we've, we hit 100% occupancy and today we're at 99% occupancy and collections have stayed pretty strong there too. I think collections are at like 96% today. So, um, overall, Rochester, frankly, hasn't really been on our, on our watch list. It's, uh, it's done really well for us. So, um, you know, the overall market in Rochester, I don't have a lot of current data just in general. And our, our business, obviously, doing affordable housing is kind of a niche business. But I know the, you know, volume of development activity in Rochester specific to this year, you know, has kind of slowed down considerably. Um, and frankly, we haven't tracked it as much because our product type, doesn't really compete particularly with the newer kind of class A product that's getting built. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what I was going to talk about. Anna, is there anything else you want me to share? Or? Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry about that. It took me a second to get my music. Can I hear you? I should have said. <laughs> that's right. Um, I was just trying to see if there's any uh, direct questions on that. So why don't we just uh, hang on with that. Thank you so much, Alex. And then I'm going to toss this yeah. over to uh, Ben and Dan. I think you guys are working a little bit together to talk a little bit more about um, what you're seeing from Fannie, Freddie, some of the agency uh, uh, pricing approaches to what we're facing. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Anne. Uh, so this is Ben Bastian. I'm at CBRE here in the Minneapolis office. Um, and uh, similar to Dan, we, we focus on uh, very, very similar uh, deals and loan types with multifamily lenders, Freddie and Fannie, and life companies. And I think we're going to kind of divide and conquer this topic here 
I think the, the specific bullet point was impact on financing, uh, pricing term, IO, et cetera. So, you know, I, I was going to jump in, talk a little bit about agency and then uh, things that I missed. Uh, Dan might be able to, to add some, some commentary and also uh, realizing that we've got uh, somebody from Freddie Mac at a later panel. So not, not to get too deep into the details um, and some other mortgage bankers um, later speaking. So I think, you know, really kind of at a high level, um, it, it sounds crazy, but the impact on kind of now during COVID underwriting uh, and pricing has actually stayed pretty similar for acquisitions. Um, there's a big focus on collections, occupancy, and really the underwriting has, hasn't got as much, I wouldn't say it's gotten more um, difficult as far as the hurdles are higher, but I think what the agencies are wanting to see is a rent roll that's within you know a few days of third party inspections. They wanna see a rent roll right before you submit the loan packages. They wanna see collections you know, kind of month to date. We're on the 6th of, the, of November right now if we were submitting a loan to Fannie or Freddie right now, they would ask us how are collections looking so far in November, which they wouldn't have asked pre COVID and that's not going to play a large part into the underwriting, but they want to just see how are they coming compared to prior months um, with the stimulus kind of dropping off and a new one being in limbo here. So really trying to get ahead of any sort of, um, declining collections and, and making sure that the loan that they're making is, um, is going to be able to, the debt coverage is, or the debt service is going to be able to be funded by the loan. Um, these are non-recourse loans. So they're focused on the property to support the debt coverage um, and not the sponsor, like um, a lot of recourse bank loans. So um, I think a big thing that's come into play uh, for any of those borrowers out there that have done a, a Fannie or Freddie loan in the last, what is it, seven, eight months is the COVID reserve or what they're calling a debt service reserve. Um, it's on almost every Fannie and Freddie loan right now. And uh, by the way, I'm going to talk about Fannie and Freddie. There's a HUD specific group later. So um, they'll, they'll talk to HUD um, differences, but uh, you know, it ranges from, no months of debt service if it's a very low leverage, high debt coverage ratio deal to, you know, maybe 12 months or even more of annual debt service in a reserve account that uh, that is held for kind of a what if situation. Um, but overall rates, you know, they kind of spiked in uh, early or late March after really kind of COVID was recognized nationally as being real. I think I kind of remember in mid-March where NCAA and some athletes, you know, sports kind of started to taper off and shut down and offices started going remote was mid-March. And that's when we saw the debt service reserve come into play. And that's one thing that uh, has allowed agency loans to continue being very aggressive. And those rates jumped up to 4% or even higher, and they're back down to 3% or sub three. So Dan, I don't know. Do you want to add anything on the agency side? Do you want to jump over to life companies and touch yeah. on the bank or? Yeah, no, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. Thanks, Ben. I think that was a really good summary on the agencies. Um, you know, I'm Dan Treble. I'm the, I manage the Minneapolis office for Northmark here in town. Um, you know, we're a Fannie Freddie HUD lender as well, but I think, uh, I think Ben did a nice job of, of kind of giving the outlines. And I, and I think you're right. I think that COVID reserve, frankly, is one of the big things holding people back on the acquisition side, just because it changes their, you know, their return, even though they're going to get the money back eventually, it's still, it's still additional dollars that have to come out of pocket at closing. And, and, um, so, you know, we're seeing people shy away from that a little bit, um, you know, Clearly, the agencies are Fannie, Freddie, Hutt are, are a great choice for multifamily financing. Um, you know, I'll kind of touch on some of the other sources out there. Obviously, there's a, a ton of capital out there chasing deals, uh, chasing multifamily deals. Though I think, you know, since I've been in the business, multifamily has been kind of the the lender darling, if you will. And and I think right now, 
especially on the life company side um, and, and perhaps the bank side, it, it, industrial is, is, you know, maybe, in, maybe in first and multifamily a close second, but having said that still, still a ton of money out there available for acquisitions and refinances, you know, on the, on the uh, life company side, it's still very active. You know, they, they, unlike the agencies, they kind of took a pause when COVID started um, you know, pretty much everyone's back in the market now, though they're not really pushing leverage. Um, you know, the agencies are still the best from a leverage perspective. But having said that, you know, the best life company deals, low leverage, kind of the, you know, quote unquote, perfect deal, if you will. And we're seeing super low rates there, um, you know, well below three, below two and a half, even in some cases for, for kind of ultra low leverage, perfect deals. Um, you know, they're able to go longer term. So to the extent you could, you want to lock up a deal for 20 years or 25 or 30 years, they're able to do that. So a nice, you know, a nice avenue, but not, not necessarily for everybody. Uh, you know, CMBS, not, you know, not everybody's preferred lender type, but worth mentioning, um, you know, there's a time and a place for that. Their money is, is still in the threes. Um, you know, again, if you can do a deal with the agencies or life companies or banks, it's, it's probably preferable. But, you know, we're doing a deal, a CMBS deal right now on a converted hotel that's uh, been converted into, into workforce housing and kind of freshly stabilized. And so, you know, some of these deals that don't fit the, everyone else's box, um, you know, CMBS is, is active, though volatile, or potentially volatile, volatile excuse me. Um, but certainly, it's certainly an option. I think... It, you know, on the, and not to get too deep into the bank side, but certainly during COVID, you know, a lot of banks initially pulled back, uh, you know, none of them really are at the same kind of loan to cost that they were at a couple of years ago. And so as a result, borrowers are looking for other types of money, um, you know, whether it's mezzanine money to go on top of their construction loan or pace to go on top of their construction loan or just joint venture equity, you know, JV structures, we're looking at a lot of that type of money and, you know, they're looking for the new construction deals because that's where they can get their returns. Typically, you know, they may look at value add, but um, the value add properties seem to get bid up quite a bit. And so they're, they're you know, largely focused on, on uh, construction deals right now and even going behind HUD uh, for, for uh, equity, long-term equity. So, you know, that's just, that's just kind of an overview of, of, of you know, what's out there um, in the current environment. There's still plenty of money and uh, it's just a matter of kind of what you're trying to get done. And, but, you know, as, as multiple people have said, as we've gone here, I think the, you know, this, this worry about, about the eviction moratorium going away and worrying about collections is definitely top of mind for everybody and, and getting more scrutiny now than ever. But uh, Long and short is there's still still a lot of capital out there. So, yeah, and I think Dan, going back to the agencies and that COVID or debt service reserve, I think it's you mentioned that it's I think it's 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 not a permanent hold for the uh, entire ten year loan term, which most agency loans are ten years. It's it's released uh, once COVID uh, is is uh, no longer recognized on the FEMA website and the property continues to meet its, its occupancy and, and debt coverage requirements. And, you know, at the, at the long point, it's, it's 12 months, call it. So it's not, it, obviously no borrower likes their cash to be uh, tied up with the lender, but it's not, it's not a forever thing. Um, but it does, it works better on cash out refis than it does acquisitions um, just because, people are usually looking for that last dollar and 75 or 80% on acquisition. So um, that's where it gets tough when you say, well, and you also have to bring, call it 3% for a debt service reserve. Um, but those low rates are what, uh, what offsets those, uh, those reserves. So I think that was a good summary, Dan. Um, I was just looking to see if there's any questions regarding anything we, t we spoke about. It doesn't look like it. So. I don't know, Ann, if you have anything to ask or Tom. Yeah, um, I think for, uh, a question for Ben and Dan. Uh, with new construction transactions that agency lenders are looking at, like, like your two shops, what are the characteristics of transactions that you're shying away from in terms of 
uh, market situation, uh, borrower sponsor characteristics, or you know product types. Just curious what you're you're kind of putting in a box saying, yeah, we're not going to go near that. I can, I can kind of take a stab at it, Ben. I, it, you know, I think as far as just market rate deals, um, you know, it really, there's, and we keep saying it, but there's a really high level of scrutiny on the collections. And so to the extent there's a, a ton of concessions that need to be factored in, it might be tough to really, it, until those have burned off and until you get some track record there, it might be tough to really push the leverage. Um, you know, both Fannie and Freddie had, had pre-stabilized programs that would allow you in, in a lot of life companies that would allow you to kind of get in early, if you will, once you, once they establish some rents and a track record, um, those programs are, you know, not totally on the sidelines, but certainly not being pursued as aggressively. And that's just kind of on general business. Um, you know, if you want to talk about niche property types, like a student housing or senior housing, you know, those just get to be super deal specific. Uh, and it's all about the story of that particular deal. Um, but the business is still getting done, maybe not quite as aggressively, but uh, definitely case by case basis. Um, ben, if you've got anything to add there. I think, I think that was a good summary. <laughs> well, um, I'm not seeing other questions popping up yet. So I want to make sure, Bill, that you get a chance to uh, weigh in with your perspective. Super. Uh, I'm Bill Beard with the Beard Group. And uh, let me see where I can find No, I guess I should have. Um, <laughs> I, sh I should have uh, test drove this first, uh, which I haven't done that. Um, how do I back out of this? Because I'm failing here. That yeah. There okay. we go. Okay. Um, well, I apologize. I'm not, I'm not going to. Uh, I'm not going to use my. Uh, PowerPoint. So we'll just kind of walk through. Let me give you a quick uh, recap on where the OC industry um, really is as, as the you know, end of um, December of 2019. The OC industry, when it came out, it attracted about $75 billion worth of capital that has gone into it. About half of that has gone into real estate projects, and about the other half of it has gone into funds. Um, and I should make the clarification half of it went directly into real estate projects, the other half went into funds of which a significant portion of that has gone into real estate. And then there's um, about 5% of it, 6% of it has gone into other things, whether it be wind, solar, um, turbines, those type of things. Um, and there have been about 1,500 OZ funds that have been created. Um, initially, I think when the OZ um, funds were created, it was contemplated that it would sort of be deal first, and then it would seek the capital to come into the deal as as you all know, the OZ funds um, are um, really are sent as tracks that it meets certain criteria. And um, so it has, it's limited by what the zoning is within that census track and what you can do within those specific census tracks. So a lot of it has found its way into residential and uh, now it seems to find its way into some others. But the funds have bring in an advantage in that um, initially if you had the deal first, you had um, you were seeking capital without someone who had had a gain. Let's say they sold their stock, they sold their business, um, and they wanted to invest that. The 180 80 days, you put that into a fund, and there, you know, as you all know, that's sort of quick timing to do. Um, you know, sell your business, figure out which fund you want to, which deals you want to go move into. So the funds allow you though to spread that out for 31 months which I think you know, makes a lot of sense and probably makes the tool of the OZ funds more viable. Um, as it relates to um, the CARES Act then came uh, and even extended that longer. So, and uh, it had in a provision to where any deals that were done in 2020, you then you were excluded from the 180 day rule and you could do that, you could invest by the end of the year. Um, so it gave some relief to that. Um, we we um, happen to start a project in Robbinsdale, um, Birdtown Flats, which is a 153 unit Class A property uh, that happened to be in an OZ fund. And we got started with that um, really as the OZ fund legislation was enacted and uh, before even really any of the guidance came out from the IRS. Um, 
And in actually a year in uh, 2018, as we were under, so under construction, we made a deal uh, with Dwayne Lund and, and his group to acquire it and they put an OZ fund together and then did that, acquired it here uh, this spring. So, and we kind of maintained some piece of that. Um, and interestingly enough, that was a deal that came online during the heart of COVID, the first phase open in February. Um, and we had about 40% of the building that was available. And uh, then the COVID came and slammed in and we opened this full building on April 1st. And uh, it's very remarkable what we've been able to, you know, we're 97% occupancy today. We've been able to maintain our rents. We went through a period of months there where everything was virtual. I mean, literally the, uh, the, the tenant who was moving in uh, in the months of May and June had never been in the building um, and were seeing it for the first time real up close on the day of their move-in day. Um, so we were thankful for the way that things happened. We did have some pressure on our deal. We talked a little bit about concessions. We, um, in our properties, on our corner units, so we typically make them bigger. We direct them really towards the empty nesters with the idea that people will be selling their homes and moving in. We do them a condo quality and we um, charge a higher price. Those obviously during the middle of COVID, people weren't putting their house on the market. Um, and uh, that particular, the empty nester, they've got to come in, look and see and touch feel um, before they're going to make a, a buying decision, so to speak. So we did do some concessions on those, but those have, have leased up. Now we're working on um, kind of doing the reverse. We've started a project in South St. Paul where we'll do two phases. The first phase will be 154 um, market rate class A units. And um, we're seeking uh, $11.5 million of OZ capital that will go into that deal. The second phase will seek $9 million in OZ capital. And, um, and that's 109 unit um, class A product too as well. Um, in terms of from a developer's perspective, OZ Capital is, isn't cheap. The investor expects about an 8% PREF return and your deal has got to pencil out um, to have an IRR up, up in the high teens, mid, mid to high teens in order to make the economics work. Um, but it is a source of capital. Um, and um, from a developer's perspective, you've got, um, you know, you're, uh, you have a lot less leverage um, in the deal with that amount of um, equity going into it. So um, that is the quick rundown on the OZ Capital. I want to give our panelists, I don't know who else is in, uh, involved in deals with it or financing an OZ, if you want to comment on that. Otherwise, I want to do sort of a lightning round uh, of questions in terms of uh, what do you see as sort of that key uh, opportunity? You know, what's your summary on what are that, what's that key opportunity that this environment is providing and what is the thing you're most either watching for or nervous about, uh, you know, in the months ahead in this environment? I haven't seen breaking news that are about any other shifts in the moment. It's a minute to minute sometimes, uh, but what's that key opportunity or not? But first, any additional thoughts and comments on what Bill has said on that? So then let me throw this back over. Uh, ben, maybe I'll start with you about sort of, again, in, in sort of that summary form, what are you looking around around the corner? Around the corner? You know, I guess we see, uh, in a big picture, we still see multifamily uh, kind of leading the way. Um, housing shortages, just housing is obviously needed. Um, especially at the B and C levels. So we continue to see big demand for it and rates, whether it's Fannie or Freddie or life companies, banks, just a big appetite for it. And we see, I, I guess I'd say, I'd say occupancy should stay high. Collections is the question mark, but occupancy will stay high and in, in how many people are continue to pay. So that's, that's a factor and question out there. Yep. Dan? Uh, sure. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I agree with Ben. I think, um, you know, to the extent that there's a way to build um, affordable housing, you know, we certainly see that as a uh, as an opportunity, um, you know, for everyone on this panel, frankly. And, and uh, you know, with Freddie and Fannie not knowing, 
number one, they're trying to get out of their conservatorships. Number two, they don't know what their, what their volumes caps are going to look like yet, like yet for next year, but certainly there'll be a continued focus on affordability. So we see that as a big positive and, and, uh, you know, hopefully they hopefully they get figured out. Any anything you're losing sleep over these days? Oh, I never stop. <laughs> um, you know, I think it, it it's just you know what's going to happen with the with the economy and and you know will there be continued stimulus? Uh, if not, you know, kind of what happens and what happens to these rent and collection levels and how lenders look at that. I, I'm also curious as as I go around the horn here. Um, whether we're seeing a difference in the utilization of some of these federal and state resources to provide rent assistance to try to close that gap. The rental revenue, um, I, I know it hasn't been fully utilized. It hasn't been fully utilized yet, but certainly that assistance is out there to try to uh, address that. Uh, Tom, any thoughts? Uh, yeah, I think opportunity-wise, uh, affordable housing in the suburbs, I think if, if you can get through sometimes the nimbyism or just the, the more difficulty that you might find in the suburbs, I think the demand is just so deep that uh, picking a, a good location in the suburbs and building affordable housing, doesn't matter if it's for families uh, or seniors, I think that that to me is, is a great opportunity. Uh, some of the obstacles or things that I'm kind of scared of are the just the vol large volume of new units that are hitting the market uh, in the in the next year during a lot of uh, kind of poor fundamentals, frankly. Um, so I'll be curious to see how that all shakes out. And then I'm actually just really uh, kind of frightened about just the potential number of evictions and if that could trigger uh, a lot of homelessness and, and just how we're going to manage that because that, that'll create a lot of misery for um, a lot of working households. Thank you. Uh, Bill, I'm going to throw it back to you and then we'll round it out with Alex. Well, I think I would share, you know, just underline what others have said in terms of, in terms of the near term, as we move out of, you know, once we have the vaccine, once we start to get to some normalcy, you know, how things are going to look and how this eviction issue gets resolved. But also, too, I think from a, another perspective is that, you know, this will have changed us. I know as we take a look at how we're looking at our amenity packages, you know, the, this idea of working from home and the large, large number of people that are now working from home, I think that that's a trend that, you know, not everyone's going to go back to the office. And not every business is going to want to have as much uh, commitment, and, you know, they'll have more flexibility. And so we need to define homes and common area spaces that, um, take it, take advantage of that opportunity and meet people's needs as it relates to, you know, having, you know, little conference area, private areas. I mean, it's, for, it's hard to run your life in a, a studio, um, you know, with your office set up in it. And um, you know, so as we build these, build these projects, we need to incorporate spaces to make that happen. So I think there'll be a lasting effect on uh, long-term in terms of what we do in the bricks and mortar aspect to, to deal with the effects of the COVID. I, I'm just going to joke about that too, Bill, because certainly the open concept that became so popular when you have a couple of kids doing school and a couple of adults do, working all at home, that open concept becomes slightly less attractive. But right, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah we've, all, we've all been on the Zoom call where someone has tried to manage that, you know, ongoing little disaster, which is just life, right? I mean, yeah. how do you tell your three year old, you know, hold it, you know, daddy has got an important call he needs to make, you know? So. <laughs> I, I'm embracing the kid and pet appearances. I, I think that adds, adds flavor to our, our work these days. Uh, Alex, uh, any thoughts? Yeah, I just, I think everybody kind of covered most of the bases. I mean, I would kind of echo some of the comments. You know, I, I think there is obviously opportunity for more affordable housing. and I want to see more affordable housing created in the Twin Cities and particularly in the, in the suburbs. Um, that's kind of been our core focus really has been on expansion into the suburbs to build affordable housing. And as Tom said, it, it can be difficult politically depending on um, where you're building. Um, there's challenges, but we'd like to see, and I think we'll continue to see hopefully more funding sources available um, that cities are able to kind of aggregate that can come in and help subsidize some of these projects. 
you know, in addition to TIF, which is a critical resource to do them. Um, so that's, um, you know, that's, I think, uh, something that will continue to happen that we're uh, looking forward to continue to do. Concerns, it's just, yeah, I mean, the overall economy, obviously, everybody's concerned. We still have an election going on. We don't really know what the future holds at this point, right? And, um, you know, the unknowns with kind of the stimulus and how that's going to come out or not. And um, I have a lot of concerns about um, what you've said, Ann, about just all these households that could potentially be facing eviction. Uh, hearing that stat of 120,000 households, I think that was the number you had quoted, is uh, staggering. And kind of uh, and just looking at our portfolio and seeing some of the, you know, um, collections challenges that, that we've faced already, kind of what that looks like three months, four months, six months from now, and, and, and how we get through this. It's, uh, it's kind of uncharted waters for everybody. And um, so, yeah, those are uh, just generally concerns I think that I have. Yeah. And, and let me oh. note in the, in the chat, I've also put in some stats. The Stout Pulse Survey report in September uh, prevented to the National Council on State Housing Agencies, updated some of those numbers and downgraded a little bit, partly in reaction to some of these uh, rental assistance programs you know, that are helping to mitigate some of that. But I think that as this wears on, the households that can't pay, I think that will, uh, obviously, you're all experiencing that as well. And certainly housing providers are trying to uh, keep their doors open that uh, rental revenue you know, is continuing to, you know, slide down. Um, we are out of time. I just want to give a huge thank you to uh, all the panelists and for Gina, who's doing double duty here, uh, coming in as part of ours and uh, I think is about to open the, the next panel. So I just want to say a huge thank you to all of you. Great insights. Um, and um, with my focus, that's more on affordable housing. Again, really looking forward to those continuing conversations about that part of the market. We had a affordable housing crisis before all this started, and it's just uh, increased um, as we're moving forward. Um, so looking forward to more conversations on that too. So with that, Todd, we'll throw this back to you. Right on. Thank you, Ann. And thank you for the plug for the affordable uh, conference coming up. That's one of our better conferences too. We really try hard to service the multifamily market. Next panel, I hope all of you, I see, so I see Sherman. I, do I see Nick? And I see Julie and Gina. And we're rocking. So for the last panel, if you all want to stay on, if you, uh, if you turn your camera off and you turn your microphone off, you can just stay in this room right here and watch the rest of it and we can't see you. But that said, that was a lot of good panelists. A Alex, all you guys, you can feel free to kind of jump back in. That's the neat thing about Zoom. We don't have panelists in front of a room and you can't like raise your hand. You can just jump in and say stuff. So I'm gonna turn this over to Gina. If you all need anything, I'm right here. I'll be in the chat room. Just any way you wanna reach me, just say, hey Todd, I'll be paying attention, but uh, let's rock and roll, keep this thing moving and go on to, we're gonna talk a little bit about the development market with Sherman and then move into the construction lending market. So thanks everybody, let's keep rolling. Gina, you Thanks Todd. Good morning again, everybody. And I wanna thank my panelists and let them start by introducing themselves and then we'll, we'll go through the questions we have. So Nick, if you wanna start. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Nick Place. I'm Chief Lending Officer uh, with Bridgewater Bank, uh, local community bank here in the Twin Cities, uh, a little under $3 billion in assets. The large, multifamily is the largest segment of our uh, loan portfolio, roughly 25 to 30% of our portfolio, um, almost exclusively uh, local Twin Cities. Uh, Class B and C product is mainly what we'll uh, finance. So uh, do quite a bit on the construction side and uh, as well as sort of mini perm options sort of 10 years and under. So uh, happy to be here. Uh, unfortunate that we can't all be in person, but uh, technology allows us to at least continue to do these and uh, get good insights, so. Chris? Good morning, uh, Chris Sherman here with Sherman Associates. Uh, we're a developer, owner, operator based here in the Twin Cities, primarily focused on multifamily, but we do uh, hotel, office, and retail as well. Um, our core business um, the last 40 years has been multi, both affordable and market rate. Uh, we're doing a lot of multi-phase development across the Twin Cities and mid Midwest right now. 
which is including the market rate uh, development, affordable, some age restricted, and then a lot of mixed use with the retail components. So look forward to the discussion today with all of you. Thanks. Yeah, Julie? Thanks, Gina. Uh, Julie Tanaka. Uh, Julia, I'm wearing the pink equity hat, and I'll give you an opportunity to through uh, my presentation to learn a little bit more about that. Um, but I also, uh, my umbrella company is Compendium Capital. We place debt and equity. Uh, we're spending a lot more time on the debt side today because it's a little harder to find and to fulfill. And uh, very, very interested in continuing creating the social impact uh, as relates to multifamily with low income and working in opportunity zones and whatnot. So I'm on the finance side and uh, I appreciate being here today to share insights. Thank you. Thank you. We are going, we're going to start off conversationally, I guess, and talk about the topics we have primarily between Chris and Nick. And Julie's going to give us a presentation on the PACE lo pro loan program at the end, uh, at the end of this discussion. But uh, chime in when you have something to say, Julie. Um, so, Chris, we can we can start with you, um, or you and if you want to answer this first, what does the construction pipe well, pipeline look from, like from your perspective? Are you tracking that in the markets for your building? And I'm speaking specifically for Minneapolis, but are you, uh, we heard quite a bit about that on the other panel, but just your, your view on where we are from a pipeline perspective? Yeah, um, as, as Tom O'Neill highlighted in his uh, presentation, uh, right now uh, we're obviously experiencing a record number of deliveries, which which is impacting uh, what we are, are looking at on the go forward. Um, certainly the combination of a record number of deliveries at this present time with, with the COVID impact and uh, the economic impacts we're encountering are impacting our uh, kind of outlook um, uh, in, in certain ways. Um, for new starts this year, I think new starts are down about 20% year over year. And I think we'll see that new start number continue to trend that direction over the next 12 months, in particular in some of the urban uh, downtown locations. That's probably been our biggest challenge here the last seven months is underwriting um, our new developments in the downtown cores, just given some of the, the challenges with not having a lot of the workforce down here, a lot of the restaurants open. Um, a lot of the, the reasons that people have lived down here in the short term are are not there long-term, uh, very confident in our uh, downtown uh, locations, um, just given the proximity to everything. But uh, the more uh, easily underwritten deal for us right now has been Suburban. Uh, suburban um, has not taken as big of an impact, um, certainly as we underwrite deals with, with our lenders and other partners, there are some um, increased uh, scrutiny on underwriting as we look at uh, collection rates uh, dropping off a little bit here. So vacancy underwriting may go up from five to seven. I think that's that's certainly conservative. Uh, I think a lot of what we'll do in the suburbs here the next couple of years will have really strong occupancy just given the shortage of housing out there still. Um, but the suburban developments have certainly been um, uh, projects that in certain cases we've prioritized over uh, some of our downtown projects. But downtown, we continue to move forward with uh, select projects and from a long-term perspective are very confident in, in the downtown uh, Minneapolis, downtown St. Paul market. Uh, we're actively working on deals right now in uh, Coon Rapids, St. Louis Park, uh, Fridley, um, and, and several other suburbs, um, all generally near TOD sites, light rail, uh, and other major transit. So um, being uh, close to, to transit, I think certainly has always been a focus of ours, but uh, from a Kind of outlook standpoint, I think the next 12 months certainly will be challenging from an underwriting standpoint as we look into 2022 and beyond. I think that's when we'll start to see some of the uh, upticks in, in uh, the economy and uh, upticks in uh, how we can underwrite deals. But right now, heavy reserves being required on a lot of these deals as you heard from the last panel and other um, underwriting metrics that are making uh, these projects a bit more challenging to get to the finish line. Um, I have a couple questions, but I'll wait. Uh, Nick, do you want to 
just give your opinion on how the, the construction pipe, where you see the construction pipeline if being people either put deal on hold or decide not to pursue them now or selling when, and just what, how underwriting is impacted the construction pipeline. Yeah, I mean, we've, um, I, I'd echo Chris's comments. I mean, we've seen similar trends. We, 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 we continue to see good demand uh, for, uh, for this type of product from our clients. And, and uh, um, you know, I think developers generally are, you know, they're developers. So they're, they're pretty optimistic. Uh, they've got, you know, bullish views on things. Um, so, uh, you know, if they had projects that were, you know, well underway um, in terms of, you know, getting close to the finish line from a construction standpoint, or for getting sort of construction financing figured out, uh, those projects continued. Um, if you think about just the development timeline of a project, you know, even small boutique projects are, you know, 12 months from sort of start to finish, uh, and larger ones are 24 months plus. So, you know, that that does bode well in terms of getting through the pandemic and, and hopefully to, you know, better economic times as well. So uh, we continue to see, um, you know, good demand for construction uh, of multifamily product. Um, similar shifts with, uh, you know, folks focusing on the suburban markets. I think we have seen, um, you know, Minneapolis new construction projects that we've been involved with as of late those generally are smaller projects, um, uh, you know, sort of not in your, some of some are in the sort of typical areas of, you know, right in the heart of uptown. Others are on, uh, you know, other sort of newer pockets um, outside of those really high competition areas. But, uh, you know, 20, 30 unit building, um, you know, off Hiawatha is a different sort of submarket than uh, something right in the heart of uptown. So uh, I think developers are, getting, um, you know, really digging in and trying to find the right pocket to be in. And, um, you know, so we, we've seen good, good development pipeline continue. And, and I would suspect with the rate environment where it is that that will continue for the foreseeable future. If the ordinance that the Minneapolis City Council is, um, has, is looking at now on the uh, the 60 day look by neighbors before a property is listed, kind of and, and, and. Do, do you, are you hearing any feedback from developers about hesitancy to start projects in Minneapolis until they decide what to do with that ordinance or is it really impacting anything yet? Um, I haven't, I haven't heard anybody delaying projects specifically for that reason. Um, you know, I think the projects that we know of that have been sort of shelved or delayed have um, you know largely been other? There's been other driving forces behind it, and, and an example of that would be um, you know we were looking at a, a, a couple of projects that had uh, you know either all or a significant portion of the project was supposed to be pre-leased to a short-term rental uh, type op operator. So you know those types of projects, obviously, when the pandemic hit, uh, were halted right away in the sense of they just stopped moving forward from a, a pursuit perspective. Now, I still think that those sites, because they're entitled, you know, uh, and our good locations will ultimately get built, but um, uh, they were delayed for other reasons. So I haven't had, heard anything specific to that. Um, you know, I don't know if Chris or others have heard anything on it. Just a curiosity, and I'll start with Julie on this, but are you, well, with any of you, I guess, but um, creative ways that developers are financing with maybe non-traditional products such as PACE or others in the capital stack to try to, you know, uh, I guess fill the gap that the the loss of collections or the the decrease in collections and increase in expenses um, have created in the longer lease of time. Um, are people getting creative with their financing and what kind of things are you seeing you, you know do in order to uh, underwrite their project or get it to underwrite? I'm assuming you're asking me, and can you hear me? I at you, and if anybody, I'm sure others are adding capital Thank sources. You. But yes. Thank you. I was just fiddling with my microphone. I couldn't hear there for a second. So thanks. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Chris and and Nick, for bringing your input about the about the market. There's still plenty of capital out in the marketplace today. Uh, banks are are feeling pressure, but they're really trying hard to get the the lending out. Uh, private 
lenders are very anxious to spend their money. Uh, we're all we're all tightening the purse strings a little bit. But uh, the one thing that is really interesting is is as relates to pace equity um, or pace the pace program. We're finding that a lot of the developers and the real estate owners are really turning every rock to figure out where is the money? How can I access it? How can I add it to the stack? And they're being much more rigorous about not necessarily just going to the folks that they've used in the past. They're, they're looking for other options. Um, so frankly, uh, people are getting what they need from those that, are, that they've historically gone to and just looking for other options. Nick or Chris? On our end, um, I mean, the biggest driver for moving some of these projects forward over the last seven months has been the drop in interest rates, um, both immediate but also long-term projection on where interest rates will be two to three years down the road as we bring in long-term financing. Uh, the drop in interest rate on our construction financing has a nominal impact on moving a project forward, but that long-term interest rate certainly has a more substantial, as we're looking at, uh, agency takeouts with Hutter Fanny um, to be able to underrate a rate that's 75 to 100 points lower for the long term certainly is having a meaningful impact on the viability of these projects. Um, the tool we use most frequently to fill the gaps in our, our projects um, has been TIP over the last 20 years. Um, so tax increments certainly been a tool that over the last seven months as we've um, re-underwritten deals and identified gaps that are slightly larger, we may have to go back and uh, modify our, our TIF sizing um, up some to uh, get uh, that gap filled. So that's been the most common tool we've used um, alongside just the ability to uh, underrate um, lower cost debt. I mean, lower cost debts are number one driver of moving some of these projects forward, but depending on the location, uh, that's, that's not enough. And we're certainly shuffling around to the priority of our deals. Um, as some of the gaps have grown uh, to the extent that um, we, we can't fill them at this point. Uh, lower leverage has also been uh, part of that discussion. I mean, we've seen leverage levels go from uh, 65 to 70 down to, to 60 in a lot of our market rate deals. So uh, that's just requiring us to bring more equity to the table and certainly having an impact on the, the viability of that deal. So uh, we're um, working uh, to identify other uh, avenues to get these projects to the finish line, whether that be looking at PACE or looking at TIF, or um, there's certainly other things we can look at, uh, including um, I mean, if we've not acquired the land, is there an ability to go back and, and renegotiate? But that's a bit tougher. I think we're gonna see land prices hold very steady here the next couple of years because um, of the assumption that the market's gonna come back and it's gonna be, we're gonna have two years from now, a, a, a strong, market again, and COVID certainly had a severe impact in the short term, but uh, we'll, uh, the assumption is we'll move beyond it. Now, we'll, we'll see if that is the case, but uh, certainly we think that by 2022, 2023, we'll be experiencing rent growth again. And that's the other challenge right now. Across the board, we have a 7,000 unit multifamily portfolio. Our uh, revenues are up uh, only 0.6% year over year, and, and we were forecasting certainly two to three. Um, and that is dependent on location downtown, they're down uh, by quite a bit. In the suburbs, they're up by maybe a couple percent. Um, so uh, revenues, we, as Tom noted, uh, I think our forecasting will go down here over the next 12 months. So that's that's impacting uh, the viability of these deals as well. So just increasing that gap and low cost debt's helping, but it's certainly not, the, um, not, not enough to fill the entire gap in a lot of these deals. Nick? Yeah, I'd echo both those comments. I think, you know, as it relates to getting creative and finding equity, there's um, there is plenty of equity to be had. I think, you know, I think, Jeannie, you mentioned the last panel. I mean, there's funds that are closed that are looking to get into transactions. There's private capital um, that have seen long-term uh, yields within multifamily. I think multifamily, you know, even with issues caused by the pandemic is still viewed to be a very stable, uh, you know, secure asset class for a long-term investor. So I think those those um, factors continue to drive capital into that space. Um, you know, but I 
wholeheartedly agree with Chris's comment on the primary driving force and viability of these transactions is the low cost debt. And if you, um, I mean, we underwrite to, uh, you know, we'll, we will underwrite to the note rate on a construction loan in terms of sizing the debt if uh, there's a few factors. One, if there's a, a sort of rate locked takeout uh, of our construction debt at closing, then we can sort of underwrite to that. Um, if, or if we're providing, you know, a 10 year fixed rate that's been fixed at closing through uh, on a construction transaction, you know, we'll consider underwriting to that, that note rate. But, but in most cases, the construction interest rate is much lower than uh, what we would generally underwrite to. And if you take a lot of these pro formas that we see uh, and you throw up historical average for multifamily long-term rates in the say between four and 5%, say four and a half percent. I mean, a lot of the projects would not meet their debt coverage covenants that are set out of the gate. So the, the interest rates are really keeping these projects, uh, the viability of these projects afloat. Um, you know, and you know, the, I mean, Dan mentioned the last panel. I mean, if you think about sub 3% IO debt for long periods of time, I mean, as a conservative banker that, I mean, I get a little squeamish on that, but um, you know, I, I think those are transactions where the loan to value is very low and it's a pretty stabilized transaction, you know, um, but people see those headlines and they, they walk in with their 80% lever deal and they're like, well, why can't I get five years IO? So mm -hmm. um, the, the interest rate component of it is very, is very paramount in how these projects are penciling. And, and I think to the extent that the rates stay low, um, you'll continue to see a lot of projects that'll make sense. And should we see an increase in rates, uh, you know, I think a lot of projects will be tougher unless the economic environment is drastically improved. Hey, Chris, you were talking about what you're doing right now, uh, just even absorbing prepayment penalties. I don't know if you want to, obviously, I'm sure other owners are also taking advantage of the extreme low interest rate environment we're in. Um, do you want to just chat a little bit about what you're doing? Um, Absolutely. Um, so for uh, the last eight months of, of the roller coaster we've been on, um, one of our big focuses has been refinancing existing debt. Um, and, and during that eight month period, we've refinanced about half of our portfolio debt using a variety of tools. And as you noted, I mean, one of those tools has been uh, HUD insured financing where um, we may have a eight or nine or 10% prepayment penalty. Um, and then what we're electing to do is roll a portion or all of that into the new rate. And we do cover some of it um, in, in those refis are making sense right now. Um, HUD, and this, these are deals that in certain cases we refinanced five, six, seven years ago. Uh, so rates have come down that much. Um, again, I mean, we're back to where we were probably late 2012, if not a bit lower today. Um, so HUD is low twos plus MIP. Um, and I mean, we're looking to refinance a few deals here over the next uh, six months and roll prepays into the new rate uh, to get them down into the twos. Um, and we're also working on a variety of other, um, we've also closed a variety of other refi transactions from Fannie Mae. We did a lower leverage Fannie Mae execution on an asset uh, about two weeks ago, 60% uh, LTV and had that rate uh, down well below three um, with uh, eight years of IO. Um, and we've done a lot of uh, deals with our banking relationships. And that's been a, a big thing for us is just working with our existing relationships to uh, refinance assets here and uh, take out in certain cases uh, construction financing and kind of mini firms that were higher cost higher leverage um, we've we've closed on several fixed rate deals and several swaps over the last seven months and a lot of those have been low to mid threes on seven to ten year executions but a lot of it this is long term I mean we're with HUD that's 35 to 40 years with Fannie it's 10 year deals and with these fixed rate and swaps it's seven to ten so we're locking in these low rates between uh, really low twos to, to low threes for the next seven to 10 years. And while our you know, revenues have plateaued and we also have other asset types like hotels and, and retail that we've been working on refinancing and we have um, uh, the long-term debt service savings is certainly something that uh, is going to allow us to uh, continue to make our way through the, the challenging period we're in. Um, so that's been 
really our number one focus the last seven months is is refinancing and and we have refinanced about half of our portfolio debt and there's uh, a lot of that's been relationship but a lot of it's been an agency as well which is relationship um, and it's something that over the next six months we're going to continue to have as our, our top priority but alongside that obviously development's been huge uh, priority always for us so we're very focused on the financing executions of our development deals and um, moving those forward as well but it's been nonstop the last eight months, just changing how we operate and focusing on refis and moving our development deals forward. Long-term, those low interest rates will certainly add value, add, add value whenever we return to whatever normal is going to look like. And I, I, we, when we talk as a panel, this is just for the people listening, the attendees, we, we kind of got away from most of the questions or a lot of the questions on that, that were published by the Real Estate Journal ahead of time. So if there's something specific you want us to cover that we don't cover, um, feel free to, to send a text or chat and we'll try to get to that. Um, we kind of covered, I last panel covered some of our questions on um, project timing. Uh, I don't know, Chris, if you want to, if anybody's got any specifics they want to talk about, about how long lease up is taking now or what you're underwriting or Lisa, maybe urban versus suburban today versus pre-COVID? And, and if you have an idea of when you think that'll change. Anybody? Uh, well, I can start. I mean, um, you know, I think one of the reasons why, you know, banks continue to look at multifamily, not only from a, you know, the fact that these projects will take 12 to 24 months to deliver, that there's good long-term view of the stability of the asset class, but, you know, of the, we had properties that were delivering um, in March and April uh, that were under construction and delivered and opened in March and April. So I think um, as we, you know, we as a lot of folks were pretty concerned about how those would lease up in the heart of a pandemic. Uh, you know, fortunately our borrowers are, you know, resilient and uh, creative on figuring out how to lease up a building during that time. And they switched to virtual tours and did a lot of things which Chris can touch on. But, what we've been pleasantly surprised to see is those, those projects have leased up well. Um, you know, while there have been, you know, I think more concessions than anyone would have imagined when we underwrote those deals to begin with, um, you know, they are, they are leasing up and uh, faring better than what we thought in March and April. Um, so I think because of that, we've um, felt a bit more comfortable about, you know, continuing to look at new transactions as we've shown that the ones that were delivered in sort of the, the heart of this pandemic uh, were able to fare, fare, you know, pretty well. Um, and then, you know, ultimately we've really sort of honed in on our core long-term relationships, folks that we have a history with and um, we know have uh, sort of the means and uh, ability to, you know, make a project work uh, should, uh, you know, you need to pivot down the road because of, you know, another curveball that gets thrown at everyone. So um, for those reasons, we've seen, you know, continued optimism in that space. I can jump in on some of our uh, experiences here. So we, we have a lease up or wrapping up downtown Minneapolis um, that, that has gone pretty well in the mill district. Certainly we've seen um, a need to increase concessions, some, within that lease up. On the flip side, in the suburbs, we have a large lease up occurring in Coon Rapids. We also have a large lease up occurring in the suburb of Denver, Westminster. And what we're seeing in the suburbs is um, maintaining or a potential increase in velocity on uh, the lease ups. It's not a substantive increase, but there, there has been an increase compared to what we underwrote. I mean, we're underwriting a lot of these lease ups to be 12 month lease ups. Um, the one in Coon Rapids were 90% leased after seven months. Um, the one in Westminster uh, were 90% leased after about the same uh, eight or nine months. And that, that's 255 units. And the one in Coon Rapids is 180. Um, minimal concessions in the suburbs. Downtown having to offer more concessions, certainly a slowdown of the lease up. From an underwriting standpoint, as we're looking at new deals, there's certainly pressure to underrate longer lease up schedules, specifically in the uh, downtown course. Um, I think the reality, if we're going to be closing a deal in the next six months and opening in 24, is we'll actually see those deals lease up um, a, a bit faster as we're coming into 
probably what will be a beginning of an upswing in 2022 and less uh, competition coming online at the same time as uh, the amount of new starts slow down here. Um, so from an underwriting standpoint, we're having to underwrite longer lease ups. Um, we're having to underwrite more conservatively, but I think when it comes to uh, these projects coming online in 2022 that we're underwriting today, um, we'll see the lease ups uh, be back to where we would expect them to be, and that's nine to 12 months. But from an underwriting standpoint, we're having to underwrite longer to maybe 16 months on a deal that previously we underwrote to 12 months. Um, so that is impacting the underwriting upfront and the viability of the project from an underwriting standpoint. Um, but if we believe in the project and it's a good site, uh, we're, we're moving those forward just despite the underwriting uh, of a longer lease up. That's certainly not a barrier for us. I, I'd echo, I mean, I'd, I'd agree with Chris. I think, you know, we're, we underwrite longer lease ups and operating reserves now than we had before. I think Chris's example is, you know, we, we'd probably want to see if it was 12 months before, we'd probably want to see, you know, 18 months. Um, uh, so we, we've increased our analysis of how long we think it could take. I think an interesting dynamic, I was thinking about this in the last panel is, you know, there's a lot of talk around remote work and office environments and those spaces going down. You know, I'd be curious to see maybe Chris's thought on what um, sort of the unit mix looks like or his take on tweaks to unit mix long-term. I think there was a big, um, there's a big push to micro units uh, and studios in a lot of projects for a while. You know, those in a lot of cases leased up very well and actually continue to lease up well in the projects that we were, were involved with. Um, but, you know, I think if you've got two roommates in a two bedroom, you know, are they, and they're all both working from home, whether it's temporary or long-term, are they gonna wanna continue that? Or is, is, um, is the amount of people working from home and needing their own space gonna offset sort of the economic headwinds that we see or, uh, or the amount of, um, uh, you know, unit delivery that's being brought on to, to the market. So I'd be curious to get your take on that, Chris. Yeah, we have seen um, a lot of our customers asking for um, unit transfers to larger units. Um, and over the last seven months, we've relooked at many of our unit mixes within our development pipeline and adjusted the average unit sizes up by five to 10%. Um, we've uh, always had a good mix of, of studios, alcoves, one, twos, and some two plus tens and penthouses in our both market rate, but also affordable doing three bedrooms and four bedrooms. Um, but we have within our market rate increased our average unit size by about five to 10% based on uh, increased demand for the at-home office setup, um, which we think um, there, there will be a lot more flex working on the go forward. Uh, many that maybe spend three to four days in the office and one to two days at home. Uh, largely, I mean, people will go back to the office, but I think there will be more flexibility to be at home and working. So, um, and we've seen that certainly uh, dramatically here the, here the last seven months with a lot of our customers working from home. Um, so we're not trying to overreact to that. We're trying to evaluate it very closely and make sure that as we move forward, we have the right uh, infrastructure. I mean, we're, we're doing bulk internet in a lot of our buildings now um, and are able to do that at a, a discount to what our customer would pay directly for that. Um, so that's a nice plug and play service. Um, and then with the at-home setups, I mean, we are looking at more one plus dens and certainly uh, a few more uh, two bedroom setups so that you have the option to have that second room be a bedroom or an office. Um, and that is adjusting our unit mix sum. Uh, so we, we have kind of redesigned a number of projects here the last seven months. Uh, to uh, better align with what we feel is going to be the future demand of our, our customers. It would be interesting to go there a little bit longer, but I'm going to say, Julie, did you have a comment on, um, on anything that we were just, that just been chatting about? So you look like you want to speak. Oh, I appreciate you saying that. I just am nodding in full agreement with Chris and uh, Nick in that, you know, they both have a probably the strongest handle on what's happening in the marketplace because they're just, in the thick of it and they're wielding by the storm and stand, still standing. So it's pretty credible. Um, but what I think is really important for us to look at and especially with the presentation this morning and today is that when I look out and see what's happening here in the marketplace, having been um, in the market since the late eighties in construction lending, uh, I really liken this market to, you know, 
a lot of people are looking at it, it's like the SNL crisis and the Great Recession when we had significant distressed assets and the world was crumbling and there was a lot of uh, dire question about when and, and how are we going to get out of this and and there were you know bank failures and and people failed in their businesses. The difference that we have today, which is crystal clear, is that uh, we're not waiting for something to happen to change this. The bottom line is the vaccine is going to come and it will it will change the world. It may not get back to where we were, but we keep forgetting and we think about this being the same as all the other pain we felt in the last several recessions and, and decades. But the fact is this is a pandemic and, and it's different. And the reason I believe that it's different is the stock market is doing outrageously well. That's an outlier because there's money out there. People have hope. They have, they're keeping their money in the market. And the bottom line is the PPP will come back again. They, they decided, they said, we will not make a decision until after the election. And the government and the treasury have, have vowed that they will continue to pump dollars into the market and not allow much of what we're anticipating to fail, fail. And so PPP is coming, there's, um, there's moves toward a virus. And so all of this is just outrageously painful today, but we will see the clouds part and we're not waiting for an economic turn, we're waiting for other pieces to come together. So I just am a little more optimistic about our future but because we're all in such a painful place right now, it's hard to see beyond our, beyond our nose. And we're going back to the things that we know and we don't know. We don't know what's gonna happen here, but we do know there's a solution with the vaccine that will, that will solve our ills. So we just need to hang on as tight as possible and just keep filling the coffers and keeping those dollars running until we can make it all up again, maybe late next year, early 2022, but don't lose sight of the, the reasons how we got here. It's not because the economy was troubled. So I hope that's helpful. Um, it was, and we had a question for everybody and I'm not sure if you have an answer or not, but someone asked though, if you can get examples of the kind of concessions that you're using in order to I guess expedite those lease ups or keep mm -hmm. the buildings. So, uh, or what you're seeing if it's not you personally. Like yeah, the, the concessions that are the most significant, I would say, are in the segment of uh, downtown or uptown, both Minneapolis and St. Paul, in buildings where the resident population is specifically a bit younger and they're. 20s or 30s and a bit more mobile um, in some of the smaller units. And um, that's been the segment hit the hardest by the fact that a lot of those customers lived in those locations due to the proximity to, to restaurants, sports, work, all those things not being there in the short term. And because they're so mobile, they're able to move, whether it's to St. Louis Park or uh, somewhere else for the short term. Um, until those things come back. So the concessions in those buildings certainly are averaging right now two months um, in those locations. And that's the most significant uh, kind of grouping that's been impacted from a concession standpoint. I've seen concessions as high as three, uh, even more. Um, so it's, it's certainly in the short term here, the next four to five months, um, that we'll continue to see those concessions, I think by uh, next June, July, August, we'll see those begin to burn off and uh, those residents begin to move back to those locations as uh, sports will come back and other restaurants will come back and big business corporations, hopefully come March, April, May, will begin to have more of their team members come back downtown, both Minneapolis and St. Paul, and all that will start to trickle into everything else. Chris, you're in some other states too. Are you seeing the same patterns in other states or how is Minneapolis faring against the other markets you're in? If you want to briefly just mention what those are that might help. The most comparable market we're in is Denver. Um, and we're building uh, several uh, mixed use apartment buildings in Westminster suburb. Uh, and we're seeing a similar thing there where 
Uh, that lease up's going very well. We've got many residents coming from Denver. They may have lived downtown and downtown Denver, whether it's the sports or corporations not being there or uh, restaurants being closed in the short term um, is having to offer concessions similar to Minneapolis. And that's really what's occurring around the country. And in many cases, New York, bigger cities, it's even more significant. Um, so what's occurring in downtown Minneapolis is occurring in, I would say, most markets of the size of the Twin Cities are, are larger. Uh, certainly that's what we're seeing out in Denver too. Um, in the suburbs, minimal concessions, um, more things are open, less has changed. Uh, with downtown, so much has changed for the short term. And as Julie said, I mean, I think it's only four or five, six months from now and we'll start to see things largely reopen because we'll have a vaccine and because we'll, we'll be at a point where business can come back and um, certainly there'll be long-term changes and probably maybe a need to continue to wear face masks beyond that point. But I, I do think we'll see uh, a lot reopen next spring. Let's see. I'm looking at the questions that we think we've either covered them or the other um, the other panels have covered them. Um, so Julie has a, a presentation that she's going to give us on PACE loans. Maybe we can let Julie, if you want to do that now, we can come back and uh, go through the rest of the questions we have when you're done and see if anybody's got specific questions on, on PACE. Would that work for you? You're mute, Julie, you're muted. I'm going to unmute and I'm going to get share my screen. So thank you. I really want to just spend a couple of minutes. I've got some slides really because we can get more con through more content. And so I'll go ahead and share my screen and show you um, how you can use PACE with multifamily. Okay, let's see how this works. Get on that. Bear with me for a moment here. There we go. Apparently, that's not uh, working the way we want. There we go. So uh, wearing my pace hat, what I want to do is really just talk a little bit about this, not go through all the points of it, but let you know that we are seeing more and more developers and business owners using legislative financing programs out in the marketplace, as many people have mentioned today. Uh, the purpose is to really fill their capital stack. Um, so I'm going to zip through these slides and just give you a little bit of a working knowledge of of CPACE, it's the commercial PACE program. There's residential too, but uh, we're focusing on commercial here for multifamily. Um, CPACE is really a rapidly growing program of state statutes around investment in clean energy efficiencies and renewable energy improvements for commercial real estate. And of course it stands for Property Assessed Clean Energy. So what you're finding is that it's becoming more popular, not only because of some of the changes with regulations and government, but because we're concerned about our environment and real estate increases the carbon emissions significantly, probably up to 30 or 50% of the emissions are from, from real estate. Uh, the program is a state legislated program overseen by Page Nation. So you'll see there are trade organizations, there's a lot more activity in PACE over the last 10 years that it's become popular. Um, the program basically provides guidelines around how much can be paced financed, and it's generally correlated with equipment and savings. So we're going to have to show you a little bit more about how that works. Um, the funding does need to be repaid, even though it's, it's sort of a hybrid uh, equity and debt. It needs to be paid, and it's the mechanism for repayment is set up through the tax assessment because it is a government program. And that's how twice a year in Minnesota, you repay your, your PACE funding. 
Um, and it's really set up, as we were talking about earlier, to accommodate some of the lease up timing and whatnot so that you don't have to start repaying your pace piece until stabilization of your project. You need to determine that up front, but you can basically decide when you want to start paying it. So it helps you really understand what your debt burden will be for your project. Um, PACE funds have historically come from private equity and private lenders, but many sources, other sources, traditional banks are getting into it. Uh, many sources are popping up because of the popularity of the program today and the need to fill the capital stacks. Uh, it works very well with multifamily and other incentives. So it stacks well with TIF and historic tax credits, new market tax credits, brownfield, you name it. Um, it gets a little trickier when you're dealing with the SBA or HUD or Fannie Mae. So therein lies the, the secret of the sauce. It's, it's really need to understand the program to be able to take full advantage of it. And that's something we can tell you more about. We provide funding for the PACE program, but I want to focus on just the program itself so that you can understand the guts of it. And then I'm just going to fly through these, these next couple slides. Um, at the risk of presenting a color-coded U.S. map tracking progress across the U.S., as we've been spending much, much too time, much time looking at, um, this just gives you a good impression of the fact that the 36 states now are active in PACE. So if you see blue and your state and, and your building multifamily rehabbing or retrofitting, uh, you can take advantage of a, of a live PACE program in that state. Uh, you'll also see the lighter green is where the legislation has been passed and they're working toward generating a program. And then lastly, uh, for example, Oklahoma, the darker green is soon to become active. So it is starting to sweep across the United States and it gives us another lever with which to fund PACE projects. Uh, here is just a good visual, so we don't have to go through it all as well, but what, it, what, what I want to show you with this picture is really that if you're trying to size your multifamily development, retrofit, or rehab, the best way to do it is just to take a look at these components that a developer can use to total up the cost of the components, and that would equal how much pace you could qualify for with some restrictions. But the the tagline that I like to share with people so that they understand the components that PACE will fund, the PACE program is, will fund through eligibility, is if, if the component reduces or produces energy, it is something that would be considered for PACE funding. So you're looking at HVAC, elevators, windows, envelopes, and uh, something near to our hearts today being in the spotlight is indoor air quality. So we're seeing a lot of uh, renovations of multifamily and other type of projects that are looking to combat COVID and using these dollars to infuse into uh, improvements for their buildings. So something to consider on the multifamily side. Uh, just quickly, the impact, um, basically, if you invest a million dollars in a PACE project, you can expect to receive about 27 cents on the dollar, uh, so a million 27 back in savings for energy and operations, accumulating, adding 17 jobs per year, and reducing carbon emissions by 9,800 metric tons uh, over the life of the installation. So it's, it's something to consider when you're not only looking at financing, but creating some uh, environmental benefits as well. Uh, as relates to the, I didn't know this is gonna come in like this, but I like it. Uh, what I, I just wanna focus on a couple pieces here, really that the real compelling parts about the CPACE program and the value propositions are that it offers low cost fixed rate financing um, it could be passed on to tenants, particularly in a multifamily project. And I see it sort of more as a hybrid. It's, um, it's kind of got some qualities of debt and equity. It's more like a mezzanine financing that because it sits on top of your first mortgage, 
um, in between your mortgage and your equity and your capital stack. And it's like debt um, from a pricing standpoint. We're seeing four and a half to six and a half percent rates out there for uh, redevelopments, new construction, and retroactive refinancing. We're seeing uh, 20 to 30 percent amortization depending on the state you're in and depending on the life of the equipment that you're funding. And uh, for example, in multifamily, it still requires a 1.15 debt service coverage. So a lot of folks really come running to pace and then they realize that they have to, they have to repay it and it has to meet, <laughs> has to meet debt service. Uh, but we've got some creative ways to make it work in your stack. So it's something to, to consider. Uh, lastly, I wanted to just share uh, how you're able to increase the IRR. So for example, we're, we're working on a, a real life project here, uh, $15 million development, uh, was able to utilize 20% of PACE dollars for about 2.3.2 million. Uh, loan to value was what 81%, I'm sorry, loan to cost was 81%. And as the project became stabilized, the loan to value was closer to 70. So you're seeing that we grow with your program. And then lastly, the IRR, if you look at the shaded area, uh, goes from just a loan scenario at 26% return, it can juice up your returns, uh, in this case, up to 39%. So just putting pencil to paper, uh, you can get a pretty good indication as to whether or not it's going to help your project if you can afford it and then it will naturally improve your IRR. So uh, it's a little tricky like I said SBA and HUD um, you know usually don't don't look to pace as much and you're filling the stack but we do have several lenders. Um, this slide has teeny tiny print. Um, it used to be readable. This is a list of uh, that illustrates the magnitude of the first mortgage lenders that work with PACE. These folks have you know, worked with PACE and have stacked PACE funding on top of their mortgages. Uh, so there's, it's becoming much more popular. So whatever you may have seen or heard in the past or the myths or summaries that you uh, keep you from considering PACE, um, there are several reasons to consider it. So it's, it's becoming more popular. I'd love to check in with Nick and see how you're looking at it. And I know Chris is, uh, continues to try to use PACE. So, um, in summary, it's just becoming more popular. I'm happy to talk more about it at any time. And from here, I think we should open it up to questions about anything that was presented throughout the session. And I'll give it back to Gina. Great. Thanks, Gina. So, thank, you. Okay. thank you, Julie. Nick, you look like you want to say something. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I appreciate that uh, Julie mentioned that she it's kind of a hybrid between debt and equity. I think um, as we talk with a lot of developers who are looking at PACE, they, uh, they come into our conversation early on saying, well, I've got all this PACE equity that I'm bringing in. And they think about it like it's equity, but um, we think about it like it's debt. I mean, it is debt, it needs to be repaid. It, and from our perspective, it jumps in front of us because it's added to the assessments of the property. So, um, while developers can think it's pretty great, I mean, I think banks in general are gonna look at it a little side-eyed. So um, it needs to make sense within the transaction and our debt continues to need to make sense even with PACE layered in. Um, yes. uh, and we'll look at that and we're open to figuring out how to do that. Um, but, but I think everyone needs to go into it understanding that it is debt that needs to get repaid. It does add to the amount of property taxes that are coming out before it's available for debt service. So that makes our debt service coverage tighter. Um, and what I think should be an important part of that conversation that people are looking at is, you know, what are the benefits that are coming out of the operations of, uh, of the pace improvements that are going in and how much are those offsetting the increase in cost? So if you were a developer talking with a lender about it, I I'd try to have that data uh, on hand to be able to show, well, because we're doing pace and because we're adding these more expensive windows and we're upgrading our HVAC system or whatever it is we're doing, it's reducing our operating costs by these dollars. And that's how we're sort of offsetting this, this cost. So keeping that in mind, I think is important. Otherwise, 
um, your lender is just going to look at it as negative, 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 and because it's in front of them and it's debt service and it's another party and they can never foreclose through it. it, it there's a lot of issues with it without highlighting the benefits to the operations. I think you're going to run into some headway with your lender. Yeah, and we work like with the lender right away. Yeah, so thank you for that. There's a, um, we'll talk about some of those offline and, and if anybody has an interest, but that's, it's amazing how the banks, especially if it's a rehab or a retrofit, it's critically important. You can go back to your bank and look for, for money, which is, I would say, your first bet, your first call, because they have the cheapest debt. Um, we like to come in when you're, you're still searching for it. Um, there are some benefits to having it attached to the tax, uh, as a tax assessment, um, it does not accelerate. So it's, it's important to understand it. So we work directly with the bank. We, we as a firm, uh, will actually help with that. So many folks uh, are encouraged to understand the program as we look to clean up the environment and, and some of the real estate that we're building. Chris, Chris, it sound, sounds like maybe you've looked at or used the program. Do you have any comments, thoughts? We've, we've, looked, we've looked at the program um, and continue to be very interested in uh, exploring uh, how the program could uh, be of, of great benefit to uh, certain projects. Uh, certainly as we've uh, analyzed it on select deals. Uh, the, the challenge that we uh, have run into is uh, that uh, first mortgage debt sizing as well and, and how that is impacted. Um, but I think as we approach a period here where there are uh, lower leverage executions occurring due to market conditions, and as we have interest rates that are at near historic lows, I do think that pace financing becomes um, an option that is, is more viable um, as there is more room from a debt service coverage standpoint to uh, bring that component in. Um, but it, it's still obviously is first position over the, 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 the lenders as part of the assessment. So um, it, it's a tool that we uh, are looking at uh, specifically for heavy mixed use deals where um, if we are building or upgrading to highly efficient buildings, um, the question is, does that add good value to our tenants in the building? And um, is that a conversation that uh, we want to have with those tenants about uh, additional pass-throughs in the CAM bill? Um, so it's, it's a program that we are very interested in and a program that works uh, for many projects, um, but one that doesn't work for certain projects. Um, so I think it's another tool out there to, to know that's in the toolbox and absolutely is driving projects forward and making them viable. Um, so we're uh, very, very active in exploring how it can work on our projects. Great. Um, you know, I, Todd said we could go a little over and I think we have. I wanna make sure that we end with people having time with a break. I, I'm just gonna, I, I would ask one question about just where do you see affordable housing? Do you see anything um, Chris, I know you do quite a bit of affordable housing. If you have any comments on that, or if you just have a mm -hmm. general comment you would like to share before we run out of time, I'll let you each um, chat for a couple of minutes. Huge demand for affordable housing. If we can uh, get an affordable housing project uh, closed and built, um, we're seeing uh, whether it's 50 units or 100 units, it's leasing up in two to four months. Uh, huge demand. The challenge right now is, and always has been, um, getting it to a close um, and the lack of, of public uh, financing for new construction of market rate. It's not just, sorry, of new construction of affordable. It's not to say there's not a lot of public financing available for it because there is, but that is the challenge. There are, there are limited resources uh, as it compares to the overall demand for affordable. Uh, our big uh, focus, for, for decades has been both production and preservation. Uh, we need both and, and to really focus on the preservation component, um, looking at uh, often older buildings that um, all, are already naturally affordable and how we can preserve those units. On the production side, one of the challenges we're facing right now um, is really twofold, the COVID impact 
as it relates to collections and how uh, both the tax credit investor limited partners underwriting uh, that impact as well as the lender. So we're seeing a push to increase vacancy in the underwriting from 5% to 7%. We're seeing uh, a need to increase the operating reserve from three months to six months. Um, we're seeing other factors that are being brought forward from an underwriting standpoint that are reducing the amount of debt that we can underwrite. Um, on the flip side, in the equity component, uh, tax credit pricing is down um, about 5%. And that's due to one, uh, the economic impact in 2020 and the forecast for, for gains for many corporations being less, uh, so they have less tax liability. But then two, with the election, uh, I think there was just another state called, um, there's an assumption that uh, the tax rate on corporations will go up. Um, so that would be um, a benefit to the program. So, I mean, there, there just was a number of factors that were impacting pricing, but uh, certainly 2020, because of the economic impact and so many big corporations out there that are active in the program, we've seen pricing go down about 5%. So a deal that previously had uh, 5 million of, of equity coming in from the tax credit investor now would have uh, 4 million 750,000. So we lost 250,000. So on both the debt and equity side, uh, there's impacts occurring from an underwriting standpoint uh, that are increasing the gaps on these affordable deals in the short term. But the biggest challenge has been bond allocation, getting bonds on your affordable projects. And just There's two to three times as many projects in the pipeline, at least, as there are bonds to be allocated. Um, so that requires us to go through one, two, three, four cycles sometimes to get our bond allocation to make these projects work, um, or at, that, that being uh, a component of making the projects work. So affordable housing, huge demand, lease up quickly. We need to preserve more, produce more, but a lot of barriers to getting to that closing on the, the new construction side. Okay, before I give you guys a minute, I just the slides would be available. The slides I had on the last panel will be available. And it's 10.07, I think the next panel is 10.15, so if you've got a couple words, Julie or Nick, just to leave with the, audience, the attendees ahead of time. Uh, sure. I just say, you know, I, I welcomed and appreciated Julie's optimism. I'm a pretty optimistic person too. I think, uh, we certainly have headwinds. Um, you know, hopefully those headwinds, uh, shift to tailwinds here, uh, the early half of uh, next year. And, um, you know, long-term, I think we're all big believers in our market and, uh, our industry. And, um, you know, I think we'll get through it. We're a pretty resilient bunch around here. So. Thank you, everybody. It looks like our next panel is up. So I think we can leave the meeting and let Todd start with introductions again. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, thanks, everyone. Wonderful yeah, panel. You all can stay on again. I'll give you the same advice I gave the last panel. If you're, not, if you're a panelist and you want to just turn your microphone off and your camera off, you can stay right there and even participate if you felt like you needed to. Oh, to get started. Hold tight, everybody. I've got two of my panelists, Laura and Brett, and I am still waiting on uh, Samantha, Annie, and Brian. So if they uh, are late, that's okay because we're going to start with Laura anyways. There we go. I'm on. Hi, Samantha. How are you? Hi. Good. How are you? Hi, Brian's on as well. There we go. Everybody's coming in. I'm still learning the whole Zoom thing. You guys have probably been here the whole time and I can't figure out how to see you. Well, let's rock and roll, everybody. We've still got a lot of participants online. I see somebody has their hand raised. That's going to be a new trick for me to figure out what to do with that. Um, what I'd like to start with, everybody, with this panel. So we're going to talk HUD, Fanny, Freddie. Um, and uh, let's start with this. I want you to each do an introduction of yourselves, okay? And and in, in lieu, just tell us what you do, where you work, what you're working on. But but quickly tell us uh, for the people on here that are that are not doing agency financing, Fannie, Freddie, HUD, like me, I have a vague idea about each little piece of it. But just explain kind of what fits into the HUD box, what fits in the Fannie, Freddie box, what fits into your box, so that we all can kind of get on the same page and then we can build from there. Okay, so let's just start with Laura. She's from HUD. She's authorized to speak uh, yesterday, so we're excited to have her. So go ahead and um, and just give us a, a fill us in. 
Yeah, I squeaked in with authorizations. We are a bureaucracy, we admit it, but our time, I will say our timing right now for uh, completing FHA products, we're, we're knocking it out of the park. Um, in spite of the fact that that business is way up. So my name is Laura Simpson. I'm the director of asset management. So I'm not, I, I know enough about the production side to be dangerous. What I can talk about in more depth is uh, the fact that I have over 29 years on the asset management side and I know what happens after the deal closes. Sometimes that's sort of the important stuff because it lasts another 40 years. One of the benefits of FHA products. Um, so that I'm here really to answer questions. I'm not pitching anything uh, specifically, although certainly um, in part because uh, I think last year, the year before we closed uh, about 120 um, loans. And in the last three months, we've received 140 applications. So that just tells you about the volume that's going through the office. And yet I'm just, I'm very proud of the Minneapolis office. I think we do an outstanding job. And one of the things that I will say is that we meet goals and the goals on a new construction 60 days uh, on a refinance 45 so um, timing as, as much as a bureaucracy and getting approval just to say these few words uh, took a while um, production is actually doing an excellent job in getting things out of the office so with that I'll stop. I think that's fantastic to say you can come in and close deals because I've never heard anybody say anything about government bureaucracy slowing things down before, but I can imagine that other people whisper that in, in other rooms. Hey, let's so let's go to Samantha Miller uh, and, and talk, Freddie, and then we'll kind of get to our other people who round out the industry. Awesome. Thank you. So I'm Samantha Miller. Um, I work at Freddie Mac. I'm at, on the production side of things, um, and I sit in the Chicago office. Um, I mean, I'm on the Freddie conventional side, so we're doing anything lowercase affordable, um, really across the nation. I cover the central part of the U.S., so Minnesota down to Texas, Ohio over to um, kind of the Dakotas and Nebraska. Um, I have, you know, been covering that region for a while now, um, and we're focused, again, just on traditional garden-style multifamily, um, not – I'm not doing any of the Target Affordable or the SBL program, um, uh, although we do have those options as well. And I think that's it. Great. Let's move over. Yeah, uh, let's move over to, to my buddy Brett Olson. And Brett, uh, Samantha, and Laura didn't really explain why would you go to HUD? Why would you go to Freddie? Why might you go somewhere else? Yeah. Good morning, uh, Brett Olson, Grand Bridge Real Estate Capital here in Minneapolis. Um, you know, I think the biggest thing there is um, when capital started to dry up with with COVID, um, you know, the, the main mission of, of Fannie, Freddie and HUD is really to provide liquidity um, to the marketplace. So why do you go there? One, they've got extremely favorable um, debt terms right now, both in terms of leverage and really the lowest cost of capital uh, right now that we're seeing in the marketplace. And they're non-recourse lenders that can provide long-term uh, debt to long-term asset holders. So, um, you know, they they are consistent um, in their approach. They have been consistent, and I think for borrowers, that's the biggest thing, um, especially in a down down market or when we've got some turbulence um, in the marketplace. Cool. Okay. So let's go to Annie. And now tell me when I know, so now I know kind of why I might look at one of these agencies, but when, what, what projects fit the parameters better than others? Would I be looking at a quadplex or am I looking at a 300 unit? Am I looking affordable market rate, urban, suburban, Minnesota, other states? When, when might I look at these? Also tell us where you're working with Chapter. You can do it all, Todd. Um, good morning. I am Annie Zager. I'm with Bella the Enterprise out of uh, Minneapolis here. So we're a mortgage banking shop, um, primarily finance apartments through LifeCo, and then of course agency um, and HUD executions. And for the most part, at least out of Minneapolis, we're focused on the Midwest. So I think that's the bulk of what this audience today is too. Um, I think Brett hit on the head in terms of the product offerings of agency and HUD, and they. You can do anything from a small unit deal to as many units as you could think of. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility with their different programs, everything from 
manufactured housing up to you know high rise towers in downtown New York. Um, I would say right now the attractiveness of if you're a long term holder for sure getting the low rates locking in a 15 or in HUD's case you know up to 35 years of term is kind of a no brainer um, and at those higher leverage levels. But I guess I would say to play devil's advocate in terms of timing or a reason a borrower might go another route, um, LifeCo or a bank, is, is because of some of the bureaucracy that Laura mentioned. There, there can be some additional hoops to jump through on the back end of, of some deals um, that are oftentimes worth it. But for some borrowers, you know, they're kind of weighing, weighing those things against each other, um, whether it's timing or compliance in the back end, um, different, different things there. But, but they've done a tremendous job, I'd say, throughout you know, this pandemic of, of being there, providing that capital, providing that liquidity, being a very constant um, lender for, for our borrowers right now, whereas um, it was talked about on some of the earlier panels, but you know, other more, more conservative lenders are obviously balance sheet, private capital um, kind of were out of the market for a little bit, had to take a step back, really, really evaluate and then react, whereas um, the GSCs can just kind of more broadly be active, stay out there, and be be a great source of, of debt for, for our clients. All right, Ryan Robertson from his car. I it's just awesome. I am so love Zoom and the fact that we can reach anybody anywhere in the world. I'm thinking about doing an event from Las Vegas and taking my wife on vacation because it's super cheap right now. Do you think I yeah, could I do an event for a nice from a little casino? background or something like that? But uh, yeah, you, you caught me. No question. Ah. So awesome. Well, so Brian, uh, and I'm still trying to get everybody on the same page. And I know all of you are finance people and you're like, dude, we already know this, but not everybody online knows this. And everybody that's going to watch this on YouTube may not know this. So why, what would make me choose HUD, Fannie, Freddie? And I know you represent one of those groups, but if I came to you, Brian, and I said, I don't even know where to start, what would make me choose one or the other? I think it really depends on the goal of the borrower. Um, you know, is there a long-term strategy? Are they looking at a five-year, seven-year, 10-year? Is this something they're gonna, an asset that they're gonna, a generational asset that they're gonna pass on uh, to, you know, to family members? So it really depends on the, the disposition goal um, of the borrower. It depends on um, what's important to them from a recourse perspective. Um, but a lot of it boils down to timing. Um, you know, and I want, I want to expand on and give Laura some props in, in the Minneapolis office, but also expand on what Annie had mentioned before, just to give a kind of a global perspective on the HUD side of things. So I'm with CBRE. I've been with CBRE for a little over a year, but I've been in the HUD business and basically doing HUD exclusive lending for over 15 years. So last year, HUD's national volume was about $13 billion uh, during their fiscal year of 2019. During 2020, which their fiscal year just ended here in the third quarter, at the end of the third quarter, they did 20, almost 22 billion. It was 21.72 billion. Their record year prior to that was 17.89 um, billion, and that was in 2013. So when Laura had mentioned there's bureaucracy, I mean, there's, there's a lot of heavy lifting that goes along with these applications, um, a lot of manpower that gets into it. And when you look at when HUD had their record year back in 2013, their staffing levels are actually 30% less now than they were back then. So, um, and, and I want to get to a point that Annie alluded to that timing is a big deal here um, because with the volume that HUD is doing, um, you know, there are queues now started in, in a lot of the, the hubs, uh, which a deal once submitted may sit in a queue for a couple of weeks before it gets taken into to intake. And that's when they make sure that the application is complete before it gets assigned an underwriter. So I think uh, timing is a big deal on these deals. But again, I want to give Laura and, and her group props. We submitted a deal um, in Minneapolis and that was an A7, which is really just a refinance of an existing HUD loan. But we got a commitment from the Minneapolis office in 10 days. Um, they, that, that's amazing, to be honest with you. You know, um, the standard is 30 days to process an A7. And we got that commitment in 10 days. So big props to the Minneapolis office for that. Um, but generally speaking, you know, volumes are up. Um, HUD is understaffed. They're doing their best to make sure that, um, you know, they're, they're trying to get their processing times in, but you got to have a complete package. And um, that's, that's, that's on the lenders component. So again, um, if timing's an issue, HUD may not be your game because nationally we're seeing on a refi, if you engage a lender, 
you're talking six months to get to the closing table, six to seven months. And then on a D4, which is their new construction uh, product, you know, I, I think you got to budget a year to get that deal done. So I was 100% on board with HUD until you said a year on development. That's tough to do. But of course, if you've got other things, entitlements, and you already own the land, makes sense. Well, that's exactly right. I think most most developers get the lender involved later in the process. But if you're able to get the HUD lender involved earlier when you're going through entitlements, it doesn't add more time. You just got to get the lender involved earlier in the process. I like that. That makes good sense. Well, let's do this. It's I'm looking at my clock, 1027. I know some people logged on thinking they're going to be done at 11 and they got a hard stop at 11. That's fine. We're going to record it. If we go over, you'll be fine. You can find me on YouTube. You'll be fine. But I do want to start with then, what's eat from each of you, and then I want to play off this, but from each of you, what's the elephant in the room? What's the one thing that you for sure want to talk about related to the agency? Um, and, well, I, I've got you guys on my screen in an order, so I'm going to go to Brett. Brett, just tell us if, if you got to get one thing out today, what is it? Yeah, sorry for my hand. Keep going in front. I'm, I'm on an iPad here, and that's the only way to unmute myself. But um, you look great, you know, though. Elfin. I mean, the clarity's there. You look good. <laughs> All right, thanks. Uh, you know, elephant in the room, I, I would say going forward would be is is property performance coming out of out of COVID. Uh, what happens to concessions? I think that's kind of the piece that we're seeing the most of when from an underwriting perspective when we're looking at Fannie and Freddie um, debt right now is what's what's the trend? Um, how are these properties when when evictions can occur again, uh, what happens to bad debt? What happens to concessions um, going forward? I think both Fannie and Freddie have a heightened um, sense around trends right now at T1 versus a T3. Um, so as we continue to, to watch that, I think that will kind of play into the balance of this year and, and obviously into next year. Um, I'm sure Samantha will touch on this as well, but from the agency side, they have not come out with their volume caps yet. Um, so I think that's also the largest elephant probably in the, in the room right now is how much, um, you know, last year they came out with a hundred billion that was going to last from really the fourth quarter of last year through this year. Um, I think they're through maybe, um, well, for, for this year, they've really about 80 billion and I think they've done about 50 billion, but they have a, uh, a ton of business going going on right now. I think they're quoting probably five to $6 billion a week. Um, so that'll be the other thing is what does uh, FHFA come out and set their volume caps at? I love it. You just nailed it right on the first one. So I'm gonna build on that. Start with collections. Laura, you're at HUD. I know you're talking about it because everybody in the industry is. If you're around the water cooler, what are people saying? Um, HUD has money to provide owners who are struggling because of um, COVID related issues, mostly for things like, you know, sanitizing and, and uh, but it could be additional, additional staffing, could be iPads, it could be all sorts of things. So that's sort of my, that's my PSA that um, it's going it, to, we did one round earlier this year and spent about 12% of the money, 12%. Owners didn't take advantage of it. So from a lender community, I'm sure that you want your lend, your um, borrowers to be aware and take advantage of free money. It could affect their surplus cash um, distribution. So that I know makes some people uh, leery, but there's leery and then there's smart. So let's, uh, they should at least, there's gonna be another round of that that comes out uh, December. So I hope uh, everyone keeps an eye on that. Um, to, to your, to, to the issue of the sort of the elephant in the room, our, um, anecdotally, our projects are not, uh, underperforming and we don't know that the eviction piece is the reason, um, it is a pent up, to, pent up problem that will, you know, uh, appear in January. Currently in the Minneapolis, um, I have Minnesota and Wisconsin, but I'm aware of the region. I'm aware of, the, of what's going on in the nation. I'm one of the 12 division directors for the nation. And, and what we know is that we're doing awfully well. COVID has not hit the FHA product. 
Now, one of the concerns with the higher volume is production is going to have, you know, 10 days is great. And I bet you that was Ken Doresky, and I bet you he didn't make a single mistake. But with this kind of volume can be an issue where we take uh, riskier loans, we miss something in the process. And of course, that is a concern going forward as far as, you know, um, the health of the FHA market. But really, um, for all, all, all our, our, for perhaps all our bureaucracy results in a pretty tight product. And so uh, it's not um, uh, something that the FHA fund is concerned about at this time. We'll see, huh? There was some chatter in the chat room and on the first panel about collections. I've got a small apartment project. I'm starting to get nervous about it. We'll see what happens. Um, okay, Brett, thanks for bringing up volume caps. Uh, so that go brings us to Samantha Miller. But just that and, and kind of what are the big issues you're seeing right now? Yeah, definitely. Um, so Brett said it really well. Everyone at Freddie and Fannie are um, not sleeping so well, not having that 2021 scorecard yet. Um, that's the biggest elephant in the room and what we're all waiting for. Um, you know, deals we're signing up today are going to be 2021 closing. So we really want to have that volume figure um, just in order to plan our year a little bit better. Um, this year, we will hit the 100 billion in five quarters, which is great. Um, we had a great year um, and are really staying busy. I think the biggest concerns right now or things we're focused on are closing all of our 2020 deals. We have a ton in the pipeline in the underwriting process right now that needs to get closed by year end. And so we are really focused right now on just getting that business closed. Um, and then it'll be looking towards 2021 once we get that scorecard. Um, in terms of collections, overall, generally, they've been pretty steady. I think we've seen a little softness in September and October and really just concern as to when that other shoe is going to drop. Um, I think all of us were holding our breaths over the summer months and really surprised that those collections held up. And, um, you know, we're, we're expecting a little bit of a decline there. And I think... We have a debt service reserve that we put in place on all of our loans starting back in March. Um, and that's really given us a lot of comfort and ability to still finance these deals and provide liquidity, even with a slight decline in collections. Um, so yeah, I think, I think again, the biggest elephant in the room is getting that scorecard for next year. All right, Annie, any thoughts on following up on those things or bring up something new? Um, a little bit. I mean, I think Brett and Samantha kind of hit on the head. I mean, we're in the middle of a pandemic here, so pretty much everything is somewhat of a question mark. And in similar to past, you know, economic downturns, you know, time time will tell. And Samantha's point about the other shoe dropping, I think there's been a lot of that kind of build up. And I um, agree with just anecdotally kind of it seeming a little softer as we kind of head into this fall, whereas the summer it was kind of surprising how well it was going. Um, I think, you know, some of those product types like seniors housing, for example, collections are pretty much on par, if not better, because those are demographic that are used to kind of living on that, that fixed income. And what was brought up on an earlier panel about, you know, everyone's stocks are still doing really well, despite us being in an otherwise, you know, national emergency is, is a, um, very interesting component of, of what the economy has experienced in the last you know, six to nine months here. So I, I think it really is just gonna be a, a, a timing thing to kind of see how these things play out. And you know, there will continue to be heavy scrutiny on the trailing one, trailing three, even looking past that or now, you know, when, when we're submitting a deal, we're kind of putting, pre-putting together, here's, here's COVID performance, um, because that's the number one question to kind of see where that is tracked over those months and kind of where it's it's trending. Um, so we'll we'll see what happens there. I think it's also interesting with agency and HUD in the past. You know when rates were even a little bit higher, but still pretty good rates. A lot of deals were getting squeezed. You know on the debt service coverage side of thing, and that was kind of where they were sizing out. And now it's more becoming a, a collections issue um, versus a, a coverage issue to even get to the dollars they're looking for. So I got two follow-up questions. One is COVID underwriting. I brought this up in April and I said, hey, people, these are apartment people. Are you going to pretend that 2020 didn't matter? Because, you know, it's different, right? 
well, look at your 2019, 2018, 2017 performance metrics. And once COVID's over and we have a vaccine and everything's back to normal, we'll just kind of pretend that didn't happen. If you're a government agency, you can't pretend a year didn't happen, right? Um, so that creates a challenge. So tell me about that a little bit. And then I have a question. I'm going to put myself in my shoes as a building owner. I saw the 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 foreclosures and the and the um, moratorium on evictions, and that kind of makes apartment owners nervous. That's one of the elephants in the room we talked about. Um, do the single family home foreclosures, like the last round of those, do those people move into rental situations, and might that prop up some landlords, um, or are we looking like across the board potential disaster? What are you hearing on any either of those things? Um, I think the single family certainly could be a, a trickle effect. I mean, the, there's there's always going to be a need for housing. Um, you know, I think right now, at least, I don't have any statistics behind this, but they're not looking at the kind of single family foreclosure level that, you know, we saw in the, you know, 2008, 2009 time period. Um, so that, again, this is just such a different um, state of <laughs> economic being that we're in that things are are definitely not going to behave the same way as they have in the past, despite real estate generally being so cyclical. Um, so I, you know, the single family piece hopefully is not to that lat level and people will retain their homes, which, you know, again, with interest rates remaining low, the Fed announced yesterday, they're kind of staying in that, in their same range, no changes to keep capital flowing that people can refinance single family homes and, and you know, hopefully, um, not not get into a foreclosure level but i think the, the moratorium on evictions for apartments is definitely something to to watch um how that plays out and it's obviously going to be different um for different states and then i'd say that's another credit to the the gses and the agency and hud and, and their guidance early on in covid from a forbearance perspective they're able to put out more blanket guidance versus we do a lot of stuff with life companies um, that you know are much more, more siloed and, and deal by deal basis, whereas the, the agencies could kind of say, okay, across the board, here's what we're going to do, and and then that relief gets past the landlord, who can, in a lot of cases, pass some of that on to the tenants for so long that, that, that you know that time period is not infinite. Um, so that's we're going to start seeing some hurdles that will be, um, you know, something to keep an eye on as well. I gotta unmute myself. When when does this start? The eviction moratorium is up December 31. I think the national one is it. Am I getting that right? And then when do we start to see if this is real or? Not? I'm not sure. Does anyone else know on the the eviction moratorium date? I think that sounds right towards year end here. I know it's coming up. Yeah, it's the 31st. I think that's accurate. Okay, Brian, we're not forgetting about you. First, second thing I got to know from you is who's driving your car right now? Kudos to them. Oh, my unless, lovely wife. Unless She's, you're in uh, Europe, you're not driving, right? No, no, I am not. I am not. I am not. No, she, she's got the wheel and, and in charge, as she is with most things. So a lot of credit <laughs> well, to her. Thank you to her from all of us so that you could participate. All right. So uh, uh, bring us up to speed on any kind of elephant in the room or big issue that you see. Answer any other questions that kind of popped all along. And then when you're done, do you have any questions for these other panelists that you want that you would like to know? Yeah, um, so start from the top there. I think that the elephant in the room with HUD is just the timing piece. Um, you know, we, we see new deals quite often and bring them into HUD and, and you know, just to get a concept meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago, we scheduled a concept meeting with HUD. They were seven weeks out. So our advice to borrowers at this point is you can't have anything marginal in your application. I mean, HUD's great to work with when you've got a great relationship with them, whether it's an environmental issue, whether it's a new management company. Um, you know, there are a lot of uh, risks that can be mitigated and overcome, but the, the volume that HUD is at right now, anything outside the box, I think it's easier for them to say no than it is to say yes. So as a lender, that's our responsibility to put a good package together and advise our clients as to the right path to get a successful commitment from HUD. So in my opinion, that's got to be the elephant in the room is just the, the timing with, with HUD uh, and, and make sure that you're putting together a clean package um, with, with, again, with no marginalities um, on what's being examined on HUD side of things. Um, in relation to COVID, you know, with CBRE, we do a, a ton of volume on the investment sales side and getting to listen to those guys, 
you know, COVID, COVID was an issue. Um, you know, I, I guess it was more of a perceived issue than a real issue uh, when it came to the apartment side of things, because, you know, on, on, on deals that we've closed and then what we hear nationally is that collections are, are above 96%. I mean, the, the, as an asset class, multifamily has continued its, its high performance. And I think, you know, listening to, to trades that were going off, I think buyers were wanting a 10% discount to market pre-COVID. And, and sellers were willing to go say to 5% um, discount, um, you know, pre-COVID. But the, and this this is could be driven mainly because of the, the cheap debt that's out there right now. But, you know, the last couple monthly calls that we've had, we've had um, asset valuations in excess of what they were pre-COVID. I mean, things are, from a valuation perspective, and again, it could, it could be just the cheap debt, um, you know, that that's, that's available out there. But we've seen cap rates actually compress and, and uh, trades happen at higher valuations than they were even pre-marketed pre-COVID. So um, it, it's no, no question it's a concern, but we just, the multifamily, you know, sector has just been um, strong uh, to say the least. Um, and, and again, what we're seeing from NMHC, what we're seeing internally with their own portfolio, um, you know, rents, rent collections are high, um, you know, and, and forbearance was, um, you know, allowed within the GSEs and HUD, and I think a couple of people inquired about it. We didn't have anybody go into forbearance at all um, on, on within our HUD portfolio. So I, I'm just, I, I'm, I'm surprised with the, the resilience of the multifamily sector, but it's just been, um, it's just been strong. I tell you, I've done... It. Yeah, go ahead, Brett. Oh, sorry, um, Brian, you touched on just uh, cost cost of capital. Um, I think it'd be good for the audience on on the HUD side or Laura, if you want to talk to this a, a bit as well. But you know, what are you seeing right now for kind of the two twenty three F refinance um, in terms of rates, um, and then also the two twenty one D four construction program? You can just hit on hit on those rates and. Yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of people um, watching here today that would like to kind of know the ballpark, you know, interest rates we're seeing. So maybe we could go across the board and talk Fannie and Freddie afterwards. Um, actually, you guys usually know better than I can, but what I what I have, um, we're seeing a lot of, we also have a product called the interest rate reduction, which doesn't require. Uh, so, uh, I'm hearing some feedback, is that me? Oh, no, Ryan's kind of glitching. I'm going to mute him quick, and then I'm going to let Laura answer this. So everybody hold tight. Okay, go ahead, Laura. Okay, I had a little a little '80s guitar twang sound going on. Um, I would say that. Um, so we we also see interest rate reduction is a is a, a perk of the program once you're in an FHA loan um, and don't want or can't refinance but just want to drop the interest rate. We've seen as low as 2.05. That's as low as we have seen. I think that's on a on a refinance. Um, we're holding steady at two point four five. Is I've seen you know two point three five. I mean it's it's. I, I don't know what Freddie is. I don't know you know kind of where other places are sitting, but that's what we're seeing. And I will also just um, to um, piggyback on what Brian said. Um, I think you know FHA has about eleven thousand loans. 13? I don't know. You guys might know better than me. But anyway, it's a lot. Um, and I think that they said we're around 50 forbearance agreements. 50 out of, you know, over 10,000 loans. So it, we're just not being touched by that. What um, Family Housing Fund did a, or Greater Minnesota Housing Fund did a, um, a survey of larger owners and collections seem to be fine. I mean, they're down maybe a point or two, a couple percentage points. Um, they recently, and everyone's sort of surprised by that, they recently targeted only small owners, the smaller, small owners of smaller complexes, and that's where the hit really is. And of course, um, HUD and FHA, while we'll, we can do financing on five units and up under multifamilies umbrella, um, before we have to switch it to a single family loan, um, Folks don't. I mean, the, the lenders on this panel will say that that's, there's just no economies of the scale of trying to do a five unit building under a HUD loan. It just, it wouldn't work. So we're, we're not seeing that. I think that that's, you know, I don't know who your, who, who's the, our participants are today, but that might be uh, important to know. Okay. First of all, it's not my guitar. I broke a string, so it's not me. Um, 
But Laura, you just made a poster in my office here. 2.05%. I don't know. Do I need an emoji for mind blown? I, I never thought we'd see less than three. I don't know about the rest of you. That if anybody gets below two, call me. We're going to do a show. You're going to be live across the nation. We're going to talk about that sub 2% deal. Well, good for that uh, borrower. Um, yeah, so Brett, you had asked about rates. Let's keep that let's keep that ball rolling because I think Sam Samantha might have some good info there. Yeah, I can touch um, on our pricing and rates right now. So um, on the fixed rate side, we're I'd say low to mid threes all in. Um, that's pretty consistent depending on leverage. Um, on the floating rate side, we did transition from LIBOR to SOFR recently. Um, August first, we started offering SOFR based loans, and we'll have fully transitions now. Um, we're not quoting any more LIBOR loans. And December 31st is our last date to purchase LIBOR. Um, so in terms of our arm spreads, you know, we're at, I'd say, 260 to 290 gross on the floating rate product. Um, that has been really strong, um, a strong business for us. And we've done um, a good amount of our floating rate business this year. Um, I mean, we're running at probably for 35-ish percent floating rate um, business, which is pretty solid and consistent with previous years. So even despite the low rates and the low treasury, we're still consistent in our floating rate business, which is interesting. You know, Brett or Annie, what are you seeing from other uh, lenders? Um, I, I was going to go back just a hair when Brett was talking about cost of capital earlier. Um, so on a new, just as an example, on a new construction deal, we just had a D4 quoted for HUD, um, you know, full leverage, like right around a 3% late rate. Um, so not a ton of equity had to go in because of that leverage. And the borrower ended up going with their local bank um, on the new construction side, despite having to put more equity in, which is kind of mind boggling at, at those low rates, but because of the timing issue, that was the route they decided to go because they wanted to keep transacting, keep moving. But what I was gonna to touch on with, with Fannie, Freddie and, and HUD too, especially now earlier in 2020, I guess it's kind of old news now, but they got rid of their three year rule. So now they're gonna go ahead and build with their construction um, loan with the bank. And then we're looking at the takeouts on either the agency side or um, HUD without the three-year rule, they don't have to wait as long of a period. And in the past, they probably would have looked at a more pre-stay product from Fannie or Freddie, which have been really great. Um, although now I think that's, you know, I think it was mentioned in an earlier panel, not really a, a high point, just um, being that, the, you know, the underwriting has changed such that something pre-stay is even more scarier um, in COVID times. But but even if a, a borrower is looking at those really low rates, less equity, um, you know, depending on what their business plan is too, like Brian mentioned earlier, if it's gonna be a long-term hold or they're gonna flip it anyway, um, that will definitely sway what program they go to, but it definitely gives them more options now to look at a higher leverage takeout with um, either HUD or the, or the agency side of things. Todd, I can jump in here a little bit from what we're seeing on the Fannie Mae side um, in terms of pricing. And a lot of what we do uh, is tier two business or kind of their full leverage. Um, right now, seeing a lot of 75% loan to value, 125, 130 uh, debt service coverage minimums. But that type of loan um, pricing today is probably around 315 all in rate. Uh, Fannie Mae does have a uh, floor on their treasury right now. So it's a 90 basis point uh, treasury floor. Uh, so that puts your spreads right around 225 uh, to get to that 315 coupon. As you go down the leverage scale, um, obviously pricing is going to um, decrease. Um, if you're, you know, 55, 60% leverage, I think you can expect a 270, 275 coupon with uh, likely full term interest only. So that's another big benefit of the agencies is Traditionally, we're getting two to three years of interest only um, on a 10 year deal at full leverage and then, you know, three to four on a 12 year and, and five to seven um, on a 15 year. Um, Todd, you and I talked a little bit. I know we're kind of focused here on agency, but, um, you know, this year, a little surprising. We've done a lot of bank financing as well. Um, 
started off slow. Obviously, when COVID hit, a lot of banks were focused on their own portfolio, managing through that, um, and also spending a lot of time on the PPP loans. Um, however, really in the last three months or so, we've had uh, four or five really solid bank transactions with new clients to the bank. Um, and I think that's the big thing where previously these banks were only lending to their big relationships, but we've seen uh, banks get a little bit more active, um, especially for borrowers that maybe need a little bit more leverage. So just a couple um, examples, and, and some of this is credit unions as well, but uh, we're about to lock a 65% leverage uh, multifamily deal in Chicago. Uh, it's a $39 million loan that we're doing non-recourse with a credit union on a five-year deal at 2.96%. Um, so that was a borrower that's looking for a little bit more flexibility. Um, uh, so they went the bank route as opposed to the Fannie and Freddie route. Um, also just closed a deal with a credit union, 80% leverage, uh, student housing, which uh, we can maybe touch on a little bit with, with Sam as well, their appetite for student housing. But it was a deal where we needed 80% leverage to get out of a construction loan. And with Fannie and Freddie pulling back on student housing, again, we were able to find a new relationship credit union to go to 80% on a university that only has about 12,000 um, students. And that was a shorter term three-year deal that priced at about 390. So, you know, there's, there's definitely borrowers that don't fit the box for agency. Um, life companies continue to be, you know, pretty conservative. You have to really fit it in the box with the life companies um, today, likely 65% max leverage. So we are seeing more banks kind of step in uh, back into the market and, and be pretty aggressive um, on new relationships. And that's both stabilized and new construction projects. Okay, but banks. I, so I, I, I don't know if Nick Place is still on, but I did see in the, uh, in the attendance room, Jerry Box, CEO of Bridgewater is on. Jerry, hope you're doing well. Um, Cap rates and interest rates have got to be scaring the crap out of bankers. How are you getting these deals done? I mean, the two percent interest, two and a half percent—that's free money, um, and then that's going to drive the cap rates down. So, does that kind of keep worrying all of you right now? Or Brett? No. No, you know, uh, we haven't seen a a material decrease in in cap rates, um, although rates are. Rates are trending down. Um, we haven't, either it's the sale volume um, has been quiet, obviously through COVID, rates continue to go down, but we just haven't seen um, severe cap rate compression or really much of any cap rate compression as rates have, have trickled down here. Um, I think buyers are still um, hopefully modeling in higher interest rates into their model um, and being prudent on their underwriting that these rates you know, at two with HUD, two and a half, three percent agency across the board, this this debt isn't going to be available forever. Um, in the short term, it probably will be available for a couple more years, but at some point it, it does need to go up. So at least on the deals that I'm looking at, you know, most of these lenders are still being pretty prudent from their underwriting. And although a, a market cap rate in Chicago or even Minneapolis here on multifamily could be four and a half, um, we are still seeing lenders kind of use maybe a 50, 75 basis point um, kind of sizing metric above, yep, um, above the current cap rate just to make sure that they're um, not getting a little, you know, too aggressive over their skis here, just given that, you know, that people view this as probably a short term um, blip kind of in the market. Yeah, we're in the middle of a pandemic talking about four and a half percent cap rates. What world do we live in? All right, let's do this. Let's go around the horn. And we got, I, I technically have four minutes left, but I'll let you all go an extra 10 if you want to keep talking. But here's what I want to do. I'm going to start with Brian because that's the work backwards from the way we started. And make a pitch. Pitch me. Why would I want to go with your program or what you're working on right now? Um, and I, I don't want to hear the, the whole sales pitch, but what are the kind of two or three things that really make it interesting right now? So go ahead, Brian, if you can hear us, tell us why we should give you a call about a HUD loan. Well, I, I think the, yeah, I think the compelling component about a HUD loan is just uh, 
the higher leverage non-recourse. Um, you know, you can go at 85% of debt um, on on a refi um, or 85% of costs on a new construction deal. And you just can't find that leverage in other, other components. Um, you can go 80% leverage on a cash out refi. Um, and, and you're talking 35 years, fully amortizing debt. It's never gonna be called. Um, so if you're a long-term, you know, um, gonna, gonna clip the coupons at the end of the day, um, you know, two and a half percent debt all in with MIP, you know, roundabouts plus or minus uh, is pretty cheap money uh, and pretty high leverage and it's all not recourse. So um, I, I think that's that's the compelling argument. If, if you're the, the borrower that's, that's gonna fit that, uh, you know, that demographic where this product is good for you, there's no better time. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, Laura, let's go to you real quick because you mentioned um, not for the small deal and you said five units, but there's a gap between five units and, and the 300 unit mega projects. Uh, where is the sort of the floor for that? Yeah, um, we do a lot of work with people who have subsidy uh, contracts with us. And of course they can go small. They've got certain benefits to that. And I don't know, um, if there's rental subsidy attached, we do go down. I, I, I actually snuck one in at three units. We, we can't do that with everybody. So um, uh, we recognize that what we're seeing as, as new, new borrowers, no experience with HUD previously, they're coming in, at 30 units seems to be about as small as we see from a brand new um, borrower, new to HUD. And one of the first things we obviously, you know, and I always, Every year when I am able to do this, I always put in a just a reminder that we do indeed control reserve for replacement. I know not all um, owners uh, e recognize that as a benefit long term, and we also control uh, surplus cash distributions out of surplus cash, and th that's a, another thing that um, is sort of so. Um, I, I'd love for the panel to to talk about how uh, going FHA is the way to go, and I will explain that. Um, it's not all, you know, uh, low interest rates and roses. So, yeah. I appreciate those caveats because I think Brian's phone was just starting to blow up off the hook. So we don't want to quite, you know, overwhelm him. Uh, let, so let's go to Samantha then. I think that that's a natural transition to you. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, from my seat, I think you go agency or Freddie. Um, the low rates, right? We've all talked about that. I think, um, it's a crazy time right now and locking in a 3% rate on a 15 year, 12 year term um, is incredible. So that's great. Um, our certainty of execution and just ability to get deals done, right? We're a counter cyclical um, organization and we're here to provide liquidity during these times. And so um, I have been involved in many conversations where collections have fallen because of COVID or the student housing market you know, we were all on pins and needles waiting to see if universities were going to go online and how we were going to pivot um, to kind of this new world while still providing liquidity. And we've done that. We've still financed student housing deals. Um, they are acquisitions. They are pretty low leverage, but we're in that space. We're still closing on deals with declining collections and finding a way and a structure to get comfortable and still provide that liquidity. Um, so I honestly, it's certainty execution. I think if you are worried about things and you want to lock in that low rate, um, we'll, we'll find a way to get it done. So we talked about volume next year. Um, how many people are, do you have any indication? How many people are going to be able to give you a call and get their deals refi? Next year, we have no idea. Um, none. Absolutely none, which is crazy. And it, it is really late in the year to get the volume number. Um, last year we received it uh, early to mid no October. Um, so this is late in the year, um, but we have absolutely no idea. Your guess is as good as mine. I don't even have an educated guess, but I bet uh, I bet Annie <laughs> does. Cause so Annie, um, I don't know if you heard, were you heard Chris Sherman? They're refinancing everything that's not tied down. Is that pretty typical? And then, oh, and then, so let's say Chris calls and says, let's look at all of it. What is it that is the most appealing out of that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, a, a, a lot of the refi calls have been interesting because you're seeing more of a willingness um, 
to pay a larger prepayment penalty than the past has been somewhat prohibitive, but um, now you know a rate at three percent or less really mitigates that, and you can you can make that that penalty back in you know a, a tax deduction and prepaid interest, and then you know in sometimes only a couple of years or or in cash flow right away. So I think that that's been a a huge piece um, or a, another guiding principle when someone's looking at their portfolio and it even starts. Normally, you probably wouldn't look at refining a deal until you're pretty close to your maturity, especially if you have a balloon payment. Um, but now people are starting to look out, I would say, even within the next five years and say, what can we be doing now? Because, you know, the kind of age old lending question is you kind of take the bird in the hand, right? Like, I think broadly, right now, people aren't thinking rates are going to skyrocket. But if you have a 3% deal sitting there, and especially um, you know, with HUD or the agencies where you can get full dollars out, pull some of that equity out, redeploy it, um, take a little bit of cash out. And I think in some cases, either use that um, to help properties that are underperforming a little bit, or I think there are some folks sitting around kind of waiting for some opportunities, probably less so in the multifamily space, but more in other asset classes um, where where cap rates might start dropping more precipitously, like a hotel deal, for example, um, where, where there might be more opportunity there to, to acquire more assets as we kind of come out of, of pandemic mode in the next, well, ideally less than 12 months or so, but we'll, we'll see what happens there. And to Brett's point earlier with cap rates, I mean, when, you're, when your rate is as low as it is, um, I think from a return profile with your equity, you know, you can, the cap rates aren't going to start going up precipitously um, be, because of that um, return profile that you're already getting based on just having a, a lower cost of capital to begin with. Yeah, cap rates are a crazy, when they get really low, it gets really bizarre, doesn't it? So, you know, going from a 10 cap to a nine cap, okay, I, maybe 10 years from now, I'll get that price for it. But going from a five cap to a four cap is kind of be freaky for some of y'all. When am I, when my takeout's going to get weird. Uh, Brett, man, you got to take us home. It's 11.03. Uh, but what I want you to do before, is, I know you, you probably have worked with all these different types of lenders. There were about 15 bullet points on what we were supposed to cover. So make sure I didn't miss anything because I'm not a HUD, Fannie, Freddie expert. But uh, take us home. Tell me if I missed anything. Recap what we talked about. No, I think I think we covered most of it. Um, you know, kind of my leaving message, I think, to to the audience or borrowers out there, and and this kind of um, is kind of a pitch for for Annie and Brian as well. But you know, I think it's important in today's market um, to you know work with a mortgage banker that does have access to all all of this capital. Um, all, all three of us here on, on the mortgage banking side have access to Fannie, have access to Freddie, have access to HUD, um, in addition to life insurance companies and banks. And each lender is looking at the world through a different lens um, today and having the ability and, and our job to clear the entire market um, for our borrowers, I think is very, very valuable um, to a borrower today, just because you know, you, you match their objectives with the best debt um, out there and, and with where rates are and, and the availability of capital. Um, I think that's ever important here today. So, you know, the, the leading message is, you know, there's a lot of capital in the market. It's extremely cheap. Um, there's a little bit more structure um, involved in some of these loans in reserve, you know, in regards to COVID reserves and, and the like. But if you're a borrower and can still get 70, 75 percent leverage at plus or minus three percent, um, your property return should look pretty good. Fantastic. And I also can say for the first time in my short web hosting career, somebody put in the chat room their phone number and a deal that they want to make with one of the panelists. I think it's pretty cool. That tells me things are hot. Uh, thank you all very much. Again, uh, just logistically, I'm going to put this on YouTube. Uh, I'll, I'll put everybody's, uh, when it goes on YouTube, I'll put your headshot and your contact info on there. Um, and, and everybody can rewatch this. You can send it around to other people. Also, I have a news show on Mondays at 11 a.m. We have a really awesome news anchor from Houston, Texas that reads the news for us. And we kind of deep dive into things that happened during the week. I'll clip panels out of some of the, or clip, sorry, panels, pieces out of 
some of the panelists and include it on there. So watch us Monday at 11. You might make the news. Uh, fantastic panel. Great event. Thank you, everybody, for participating. I thank you, everybody, who participated outside Minnesota. It's one of the things that I love about this pivot. COVID sucks. I hate not getting together. I would rather see each other. But we were able to see people from all over the Midwest and Texas, so it's pretty cool. Thanks, everybody. Wonderful weekend. Enjoy the weather while we still have it in Minnesota. Oh, Thank I you. should do a different view so you all can wait like this. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, everyone.